real quick in a nutshell, how important are youth athletics and not just athletics, but competitive sports as a youth from maybe four or five, six years old, you're, you're approaching 40 and you're a very successful athlete. How important was that foundation of athleticism, athletic events and competitiveness against your schoolmates, against your brothers and sisters? How important to that is that playing in your role in life now? I think it's super important. I think that what I learned in my experience as a young athlete, a student athlete growing up was everything. That's what defines your character. That's who makes you who you are. That's how you learn how to play with your friends, how you learn how to, you know, share or not share. So I think it's critical. And I think we're seeing a, a big part of it missing in today's age is, you know, today's generation is missing that. So I'm where I'm at today. I'm actually 42 years old. I'm definitely where I'm at today because of what I learned in my, in my younger days as, a, as an athlete. And when you, when you, Talk to people now, Joey, about, you know, these quote unquote participation awards. And back in our day, there was no such thing. It was either a joke, you know what I mean? Like you, you win and you get second place, you get third place. And if you didn't, it makes you strive to become a better player or a better competitor or, or, or want to strive to be a champion. And to me, when you think about what these kids are doing now to where they get rewarded for just signing up. I don't think everybody signs up for life, but not everybody gets rewarded. So I think we're sending a bad message or a mixed message of, hey, just because you're participating means you're going to be on the same level as everybody else. But then when you get to our age, everybody still thinks that they deserve to be on the same level just because they're participating. And I think it's a mixed message. It's you got to win in life, right? It's a it's a very mixed message. It's not fair what they're doing to these kids. You don't you don't get an award just for showing up. That's not how life works. You got to work hard. You got to put in your time. And I'm, we're seeing it across the board. You know, people just think because they showed up, of course they signed up or filled out the little form online, they should win. It doesn't work like that. So I got to agree with you 100. percent And you you have so much competitive blood. We, we see each other a couple times a week and, and we still, even though we're not receiving these so-called trophies or awards or belts in your case, we're still competitive inside with each other. We still support each other. We still pump each other up and, and really push each other. And I think that if coming from the same common background of competing, growing up in an area where we knew each other when we were kids, we didn't, we weren't like so-called, you know, friends per se, but we knew who each other were. I knew what you were doing. You knew what I was doing. This area is close knit like that. Absolutely. And to me, that's what's special about being in a community like this part of Northern Nevada is that you, it, here we are 30 years later, we're 20 years, 24 years out of high school. And we can look back and say, Hey, we went at each other. We competed. We might've even talked shit to each other one day or two days, but now we're buddies because we, that respect that discipline and athletic and competitiveness teaches you. My opinion is that being an athlete teaches you that, that, that treasured asset of respect, commitment, and number one loyalty in life. We're very loyal to each other because we were competitive as, as individuals when we were growing up. That's my, what my opinion is. I had to say, Chad, I agree with that. And, and the reason is when, when you're growing up, when you're learning to play with people, when you're learning how to get along with people, when you're learning about patience, when you're learning about, you know, your turn, sharing, all that stuff, that's what defines you. That's what defines your character. And I think, you know, you learn that mutual respect for each other. When you see someone else that also puts in that time, that's not afraid to put, put in work, that, that gives you that, that mutual respect. So it is missing. If kids don't see each other working hard, if they're not working hard next to each other, if they don't know what, what you know, what the actual, you know, what they're actually going to earn by, by putting in that work or not putting in that work, you got a problem and it's, and it, it, it doesn't quit when you turn 12 or, you know, you hear a lot of kids say high school's the greatest time of my life. And yes, it's fun. And I get it. Friday night lights and basketball games and dances and, 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 and kind of, you know, driving a truck to school for the first time and having your own stereo and a girlfriend and, and, and going up to the pits and having a bonfire, all of that stuff means everything in the foundation of your life. But in the big picture, in the big scheme of things, high school is a very minute particle in in this thing we call life is we start to navigate through the roads of life and life can be a bitch. Life can be tough. Life is tough. And if you don't learn as a young person, in my opinion, how to compete, how to win, how to work hard, how to wake up first, how to go to bed later, how to think outside the box, how to think as a team, how to be a leader, how to motivate, how to get that snowballing effect and, and develop momentum in a business or in a, in a brand or just as an employee in a company. How to, you know, people want to be around successful people that are optimistic, yeah. people that are pessimistic and look down and don't understand what that, those leadership roles might be or what being competitive might mean. I think they're missing it. I'm not saying that they're worse off. I'm just saying that in life, 
Nobody's going to get treated. If you're not first, you're last pretty much. And you got to strive for excellence. And I think with the foundation of sports and athletics and competitiveness, that's what it brings. I think that you would agree that right now in your, in your everyday life and how you make your livelihood, you got to be on your A game every day. You got to be, you got to look good. You got to feel good. You got to stay sharp, right? Absolutely. I mean, look, the greatest thing I ever did was be a student athlete, hands down. It taught me so much. And there's no greater feeling than putting in that work, both as an a- academically and then, and then athletically. And I really do think that's what gives you the well-rounded, you know, the well-rounded tools to be successful in life. And so I want to see more kids like that. I want to see more kids competing out there, winning and losing. Well, losing is an important part of life. You know, you got to learn how to take those losses. I mean, we, we've had them. How many times have you come out of that, out of that game without that, without that W? How many times have I had to, you know, take it literally beat down? You know, but you got to get up the next day and put in that same kind of work. And so, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot less of that, but I'm not giving up on this generation, that's for sure. Yeah, and I don't want to either. And I think that what you say is so important, Joey, that in life, if you don't know how to lose, and I think it was Jordan that said that the, he never really learned how to win until he lost. And because victory is so much sweeter, and I know that everybody says that, and that victory is much more sweeter when you've been down. If you want to love the best you had to have your heart broken if you want that trophy to feel the best or that plaque to look best on your wall you have to feel what it to take an ass whipping or a beat down you have i have um you have been in a solo sport which i consider probably besides hitting a baseball which is scientifically proven to be the hardest thing in sports but as a boxer throwing 12 round and they used to be 15 round bouts you laugh at that but it's true (laughs) but to be a boxer and the stamina that you had to have in the ring and you were a a college boxer you were an amateur boxer and you were a professional boxer and we're going to get into all of that today but to be in the corner of that ring with a trainer and a cut man and that's it. And when that bell rings, now you've got nobody. Oh, doggy. You might hear a few things. Yeah. But to really. me, that's the ultimate. It's wrestling and boxing. The sweet science of boxing and the Roman days of the Olympic wrestler. To me, there's no better athletes in the world, right? There's, there's Growing up as a boxer, you had to feel like you were just cream of the crop, right? Well, I mean, you, you do have to get in a sense of shape and conditioning like I've never experienced before. I mean, I've trained with everybody. I've cross-trained with everybody. I would say that next to next to the boxers, the MMA athletes are, are, are the greatest athletes out there now. You know I mean? They're just so well-rounded. They're in such good shape. They've now learned the striking. They've now learned, you know, all the different, you know, different, you know, skills they need to be competitive. And so I think those guys are, are pretty amazing athletes right now. Yeah, and I think that if you look at the the well roundness of these athletes that we can, you know, you call them prize fighters or shoot fighters or mixed martial artists, boxing's one of those mixed martial artists. You got jiu-jitsu, you got karate, you got kung fu, you got wrestling. Um, I know there's a lot more that you're going to talk about today. You run with a lot of UFC. You've ran with a lot of king of the cage fighters in your career. Um, and being a boxer, though, being a champion caliber championship caliber boxer, and I know that you were. You've had belts from the WBC, the IBC around your waist. I've went to a lot of your fights. To me, there there's nothing more achievable in sports or competition than being a champion in boxing. And I want to get in that. Everybody, this is Chad Belding. Another, uh, I'm just humbled to have Joey here. A- episode of This Life Ain't for Everybody. The podcast is going very well. We appreciate all the support, and to have Joey here, it's a perfect set up for the 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 theme of our show because he he's a he's a normal working class works his butt off to raise his family now and his competitiveness keeps him going and he's 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 a leader in the community in northern nevada and he was a champion boxer and when we get into this it's going to amaze you what he's experienced in in and out of the ring through the sport of boxing the lifestyle of boxing But this life ain't for everybody. And to wake up and to train and to walk around at 175 or 180 pounds and then to make weight at 160 and to be chiseled and to have the stamina to fight 12 three-minute rounds with a minute rest in between, there's nothing harder in sports in my opinion. Maybe swimming. I don't know. I'd never swam that far. But, Joey, I'm happy that you're here. Um, I wanted. What was the first sign in your life? that you were going to throw hands. Were you a street fighter in high school? Oh, were you a street fighter growing up? What, no, how did, God, how did no. it happen? I went to Bishop Minogue Catholic high school here in, in Reno, Nevada. And I was the biggest smart ass on the planet and I was not tough. I could not fight. Um, I got, I started a lot of fights. I don't really think I did well in many, very many of them, but I had a lot of the, a lot of the older guys, the, the seniors at Minogue and uh, seniors at McQueen that kind of like 
backed me or supported me or kept me from getting a, a butt whooping every day. And I just actually, believe it or not, I walked on the team at 19 years old. I was up at the University of Nevada and I was in a fraternity house and a friend of mine actually bet me, dared me that I couldn't join. I couldn't, I couldn't be on the boxing team where I'd, where I'd get whooped. And I said, I bet you I can. And I actually walked up there, walked on the team. First day I ever went in there, I knew at that moment, I just got in there and started, started shadow boxing a little bit and got bit by the bug. But I really knew my first day I ever sparred and got actually took, you know, took some shots is the day that the entire gym, if I brought in my coaches in here, they'd say, that's the day we knew. We knew we had a champ. I got in there, got hit, didn't quit, was bleeding like a sieve, just kept coming at everyone and, and wanted to stay in. And they actually had to pull me out the first time saying, you're done. And when I was so mad, whoever had just whacked me, I just wanted him and one more round, one more round. They said, no way. And so, this is a 19 year old freshman walk on. 19 year old freshman walk on. And so, never been in a ring before. Never, never been, had never really on. been in a fight before really besides, you know, getting in a shoving match and, and maybe getting beat up. So is this is down on 4th Street at the original UNR this gym? This was the or, old or was Hans on, gym up by the university at the time, oh, the uh, up, up on the top of Valley Road. So you walk in, you have seniors, juniors, and sophomores in there. Yeah. You have champions that have probably been in the NCAA yeah. finals in yep. there. Couple you times. have coaches. I'm sure maybe Mr. Pat Shaleen was in yep. there. That's he a huge was. part of Nevada boxing. <laughs> yep. um, we all know the Shaleen family. Um, you get in there and you walk up and tell the coach, I'm interested in being on the boxing team. And does he look at you and say, okay, what year did you win the golden gloves? He, Cause I mean, you didn't ever box as a youth, right? Yeah. He just said, what's your background? Like, you know, how many fights have you had? I said, none. So you've never been in the ring before. No. Well, yeah, we can give you a start. You know, we don't expect you to do much, but you know, we'll give you a shot. It was a college club team. So they let me in and I just, all I could tell people is I just knew it was, it's hard to explain. I just could keep, track of things, things slow down. I see the punches differently. I feel them differently. You know, the anticipation of stuff is just there, you know, and just, it's hard to really explain, but it's just something I could do in the heat of pressure. I could stay calm, keep a toll of how many points, how many punches were being landed on me, how many I need to land back. And I just was very good at the point system. But there's no way you were in shape at that time, right? Did you go into college being in no. shape out of high school? Uh -uh. So you were, you probably couldn't go more than one or two rounds sparring or no, believe it or not. My father was kind of a, kind of a drill a spirited, <laughs> really a drill sergeant. He's actually a Colonel in the Marine Corps. And, um, I did something wrong and I lost my truck up at the university. So all I had was a pair of rollerblades and a bike and I was biking and riding and running everywhere. So I was actually in really good shape. And I think that's what, you know, that's what gave me the advantage. They didn't think I'd be able to do good, but I was in great shape. So can anybody do what you do? I mean, if you know, you hear that analogy all the time. Yeah. If I can do it, you could do it. Being, having the guts to walk into the gym in the first place, not many guys would. I don't know if that analogy rings true in boxing. I don't know if somebody could say, well, Mike Tyson was just in the right place at the right time. Yeah, that's no, not true. It, no, I just way. don't, I don't think that analogy is true in boxing. Mm -mm. I think in wrestling, you can go in as a six year old and, and develop some skills, maybe a takedown or be tough, or maybe be able to ride a guy a little bit more, stay on top a little bit more in boxing though. The footwork, and I'm not saying that wrestling's not, you know, a level of athletic athleticism that's legit, but boxing is a science. I think wrestling might be too. I don't know if I'm off base here by saying this, but the footwork, the handwork, seeing the punches, making everything slow down, you're watching the guy's belly button, you're kind of guarding a basketball point guard, but then you're getting punched by that point guard. I think, I think Mike Tyson said it best. You know the quote I'm talking about. Yeah. When you talk about, you know, who, who this guy, that guy, well, everyone's got a great plan, a great strategy until they get punched in the face. Until you get punched and in that's the just face. really the, the only difference I got to say about boxing versus any other sport is those blows you're taking back. Yeah. I mean, there's no timeout. Even in wrestling, you can get slammed and then stall by spreading out or whatever you do on the ground. There's no timeout in boxing. There's no playing. There's no, there's no nothing. If you take a knee, you're done. You're if, done. if something hurts, it's, it's game over. The point is, I used to love saying, I'm in the hurt business. I'm not in any other thing. I, I loved points in college, but once I got to be a professional, my only job was to hurt you so bad that you either stopped or I stopped you. You either body quit for you and you went night night and went to sleep. Or, or, the, or the ref stopped it. And that's all I cared about. You know, I mean, everyone said, don't look for a knockout. I looked for a knockout every time I got in that ring. Every that's time. the only thing I wanted was it, a knockout. And, and that knockout could be an overhand right or it could be a body shot. It that could would be, you know, actually, them. it could be stepping in with a jab. You know, there's little tricks you learn. You talk about footwork, you know, sneaking that right foot up as you step and then really being able to step off that back foot and just nailing someone with a jackhammer. People don't realize that a jab thrown right is no different than a, than a two by four hitting you smack in the forehead. If it's done right and it's done with the hip and you lock out that hand, 
<laughs> it's a devastating punch. Your eyes start to water. Eyes water, your, nose eyes waters, water. <laughs> can't see straight. Everything feels a little weird, warm, spinny, just from a jab. If it's so, right. it's funny you say this because I feel like a champion when I'm on the heavy bag. I got one in my shop, and I punch it, and I can go. I'll I'll go two minutes, and I'll throw as many jabs as I can, or as many cut, as many hooks as I can. And then Matt Hughes came here one time and stayed with me, and he he wrote he signed my heavy bag, and he put, "Remember, this bag doesn't punch back." And I'm sitting there going, he's being a smart ass, but really that's true. Yeah. Because if I'm going two minutes throwing as many punches as I can and one and one of your jabs lands on my head, I'm not throwing very many more punches. No. And it's like in boxing, people understand you can go in there in the best shape of your life and you get hit by Arturo Gotti or Mickey Ward or Joey Gilbert or somebody on that caliber that knows how to throw a punch. Sure. There is a science to throwing a punch. I know some great street fighters that would go into the ring and get smoked because you can't street fight in the ring. You can't just go in there. You got to have, you got to have vision. You got to know ringmanship. And, and you want to set people up in the shots a lot like they see in, you know, you see in jujitsu, it's a very obviously circular game. You're trying to sneak people into positions, trying to set them up into a shot. It's the same thing in boxing and the truly great guys with the ring generalship. Like you can't imagine the Floyd Mayweather's their footwork is just so it's just so pretty. I mean, what he really does, his check hooks, how he walks people around a ring, they don't even realize what he's doing. What he's doing, he's commanding the entire time they're in there. And it pisses me off that, and I'm, I'm, I'm a fight fan, but in, but in no words am I a fight genius or a know-it-all. I'm not like, when I listen to Joe Rogan talk about jiu-jitsu or MMA, he knows what he's talking about. Sure. When you listen to, you know, when you listen to Lampley or somebody break down a fight, they know what they're talking about. Howard Cosell knew how to break down a fight. You do no fighting. Floyd Mayweather always gets that rap. He's so boring. I'm not going to rent the pay-per-view. He's boring. Well, he's 49-0 and 0 and 50-0 and 0 now, which that last fight should have never had. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But It's a great fight. 49-0, and 0, right? You can't be any better in the ring. And what you said makes perfect sense is that, yes, you can watch him. He might not be as, as, uh, as powerful as somebody that might not get as many knockouts, but he's landing yeah. so many punches. It's prize. It's just, Floyd said it best. It's prize fighting, dummy. You're paid, <laughs> you're paid to not get hit. You're paid to, your career is only going to be as long and stay as last as long as your body. And to not take those shots. And if you saw, there was a part of, part of his career where, you know, Floyd didn't have old man Floyd. He had his, he had Roger and he was taking a lot more shots. Then you saw the old man get back in and you flaw, saw Floyd stop getting hit. Yep. That's it's. I mean, I can tell you from experience, based on experience, getting hit is a big deal. You might think that you've got a great chin, and it might be awesome that you've never been knocked out or knocked down. But let me tell you something: there are going to be repercussions. I'm experiencing it. All the guys I trained and fought with are experiencing it. So I got to say, Floyd knew what he was doing. It was about you know making as much money as you can and not getting hurt, so you can live a good life with that money you're making. And I think Floyd uh, did a really good job. And I want to talk about him more later because as a fight fan, I love him. And I think when you're talking about Roger and his dad, Floyd Sr., maybe it happened right around that De La Hoya, Sugar Shane Mosley. Because I remember Sugar Shane put him on the ropes and almost knocked him out. He hit him with that uppercut, that little short uppercut on the rope. And maybe that's right when that transition happened because the old man was in jail, right? Or, or he came out of jail and then they had, they had a falling out, but he brought him back. And I'm wondering if that's when that happened because he was getting smoked by Sugar Shane. And some people argue that De La Hoya beat him. I don't know. I'm, I'm biased with Mayweather. because It was I, a very close fight, very close. and De La Hoya gave it away at the end by sitting back on his jab. If he would have just kept pumping that jab through the later rounds, he was hitting him. He quit on him. So I, actually, people say that Oscar had a bum shoulder. I'm not sure what happened. But I remember watching that fight and watching it in slow motion and you know turning the sound off. It was a very, very close fight that Oscar could have definitely won had he picked it up in those Why? last three rounds. I don't Why? know. But what happened to Floyd that night? What, what made – was it – was it the stardom and the celebrity of De La Hoya? Was the energy in the room? What would change in a night like that? Because it seemed to me like he was hitting Mayweather when not many people ever have. You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was the fact that, you know, that Floyd Sr. had worked with De La Hoya. And, you know, it doesn't matter if he trained him for that fight or he had been working with De La Hoya Sr. for years. So, you know, if there's one person that knows how to, how to hit, at least hit Floyd or at least get close to hitting Floyd, it's going to be Sr. So I really don't know. I mean, I still think De La Hoya is a hell of a fighter, though. I mean, you can say what you want about De La Hoya. He's one of the greatest fighters we've ever seen. The way he bounced on those toes, how accurate he was, how he kept moving, and how, how accurate he was with that jab and that hook made him such a complete fighter. So, I mean, he was one of the best that, that, uh, that Floyd ever fought, for sure. I, I loved watching him fight. I went to several of his, his um, live fights, and I remember one vividly against my orga. And I remember watching the buildup, and I understand promotion. I've learned to understand smack talking about selling fights and pay-per-view and how 
Mayweather does it and how Conor McGregor and Ali was probably the best of all time at it. But I remember Mayorga was coming in the limousine from down the strip to the weigh-ins or to the fight with a cigarette lit, mm -hmm. smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. Remember yep. this? Yep. And he, and he, and he said, I'm going to knock De La Hoya out. And in the sixth round, De La Hoya hit him so many times with so much. I remember the energy in the MGM that night. I was weird. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. This guy was, he stayed quiet. He just would smirk and smile at Mayorga, and he literally dominated the fight. I was at that fight, too. You were there? I actually was at that fight, too. That's hilarious. Yeah, and he whooped him. Oh, he Made him, him pay. Hit him and hit that body so hard. Yeah. Oh, my. And that body shot that he landed. Yeah. And then I just vividly remember the camera view of that cigarette and him being so arrogant, smoking. <laughs> like, he's going to, he doesn't need his lungs against Dale. Well, you know, Dale, uh, uh, Mayorga at that time was being promoted by Don King. Imagine and that. You know, man, I'm just saying, if anyone knows Don, Don is the greatest showman, entertainer. So whether or not Mayorga smoked, you know, cigarettes every day during training, you know that Don had on the, hey man, smoke a cigarette, pretend like it ain't nothing, that you got De La Hoya beat already. You know, that you're, you're so not worried about it, you're smoking a cigarette. You know, it's all mental. Have you met Don King? Yeah, I mean, I've actually went up against him. I took him before uh, the commission for, a, you know, something with a sanctioning body. I don't want to name any names, but... He did something to a local guy here, uh, Kelly Davis, and you remember the Davis brothers oh, here. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I represented him against Don King. Nicest guy, you know, just not a guy you want to be on the wrong side of business with. I want to get back to him because I'm kind of, I want to learn more about it. And, and you know, we, me and you talk about Tyson at least once a week. <laughs> and to me, like, I don't know if Don King was good for him. He well, made it the money. worst thing that happened. The worst him. thing, right? Yeah. It's just like, I just, I, I want to get He did prison time because of Don <laughs> King. A lot of people don't talk about this, but when Tyson caught that charge, then we you know the charge, he got a rape charge. He had a tax attorney defending him. A guy had never been in a criminal case before. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot behind the scenes that people don't talk about. And it was because Mike wouldn't agree to some really, really uh, shitty one-sided contract. And so that was his, that was his punishment. Uh, that's how he paid for not agreeing to basically sell his life and his rights and his name and everything away. And um, that's how people do you. That's why it's, you know, it's also one of the dirtiest sports. So, there, you know, you don't ever want to hear Mike bring up Don King. He does not like Don King. He doesn't want to be around Don King. He doesn't want to see him. If he's in the same room with him, he doesn't like that. So how, how it, it, it like makes the hair on me stand up, like, li like learn, you know, thinking back to my youth of watching him. And being such a fan, and still am to this day, oh, yeah. people probably think I'm ignorant because I say he would whip Ali. He's the best heavyweight of all time. He's the most um, what do ferocious. I say? Is Fero the word. Ferocious and just brought so much. He's like Tiger Woods to golf. I never watched a round of golf in my life. Me either. I love Jack Nicholas. I love Palmer. I love. I have mad respect for people that are good at what they do and that can that can dominate like these guys do. But when Tiger came into the game, I was like. Man. First time I ever turned on a golf event. Right? And, yep. And with Tyson, I didn't care. I did not care if it was an interview. I didn't care if it was him riding on the bus in Brooklyn. I didn't care if it was a story of custom auto. I didn't care if it was about his deal with Rooney. I wanted to learn everything about the guy. And now, you know, he's 50, 51 years old now, and he did the Broadway deal, and he did the movie, and the documentaries. I love the guy. I have the utmost respect. And when you talk about the, the charge he got and what went down that night in Indianapolis— I hated that. I hated Tokyo or was it Tokyo with Buster Douglas? Mm -hmm. I cried that night because I, I was like, dude, that's my hero. Like I, I know people are out there. A lot there of people did. I think people are out there listening going, you're such an idiot. But I did. I was with my brothers and I'm like, dude, that's Mike Tyson. He's unbeatable. And from that moment, from that night when he lost to Buster Douglas and then the whirlwind of Don King and his management at 19 years old, he was the undisputed heavyweight champion in the world. And I think by 22, he was worth $335 million. Mm -hmm. And he's worth a million dollars or something now. To me, it's sad. I, 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 like, I look at it and I, don't, I know he doesn't want pity. I'm not giving him pity. I'm just saying, like, what happened, Gilbert? What, what goes wrong that wrong? Well, you know, like a lot of athletes, man, they just, um, they just know spend. And, you know, Mike, unfortunately, didn't have the best people in place. He didn't have people, you know, watching his money, taking care of him, keeping an eye on his stuff. And so he just was a victim of what you see so many today's celebrities do. They outspend themselves. They can't make it faster than they spend it. And Mike just had a lot of bad people around him at the time. He's different now. I mean, he's in such a great place and he's doing so well. But yeah, it was unfortunate. And you saw a lot of the best champions kind of preyed upon, taken advantage of, didn't have the right people in their corner. It's sad. Really and, sad. And the first thing that people want to do is be like, what an idiot. And I'm like, okay, 19, he didn't ask for it. He was just a fighter. 
He goes in and does what nobody probably will ever do again. He won all three belts at 19 years old. He was beating Tony was Tucker. Undisputed, yeah. uh, Tony Tucker and Bone Crusher Smith and Larry Holmes and George Foreman and Michael Spinks. And he, you can go on down the list. At one time, he was 21-0. and Remember the Sports Illustrated cover? He knocked out Michael Spinks, knocked him through the ring, through the ropes in 91 seconds. And they, some people thought Spinks was going to give him a challenge. He would come in in those black boots and those black shorts and that Rocky Marciano towel cut out around. And when he would go into the middle of the ring for the, the stare down, it was over. It was over. You know what I mean? Is that happen in boxing? When you go in, do you look him in the eyes? Is that, do people lose the fight right there against Mike Tyson, you think? Absolutely. I mean, Mike was just such a ferocious and just intense person that you could tell. You could see some of those early fights. Those guys, are, you know, they, they know they're just getting that paycheck. They want to be out of that ring as fast as they can, even if they are going to put up an effort. They just know. They knew they were in with a killer. They knew they were in someone that wasn't going to take a, you know, take a shot and not give it back. And so I think with Tyson, man, they just knew. They knew from the very start, let's get this done. It, so you 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 legitimately are telling me as a fight fan that they weren't taking a fall, but they knew that it, they might be getting 800000 or $2 million that night yeah. because they're fighting Tyson in Madison Square Gardens on a pay-per-view, Don King promoted event. They're getting paid, but they know that they're not getting out of their own. I, I would have to think that a good majority of them knew there's just, the, I mean, just come on, just the, the numbers, the chance of me stopping this guy or not taking a shot to the face that stops me is pretty slim. And I just think you had to. I mean, he was just, he was that, he was that mean and that tough and it was hurting people. Like you said, the fights were seconds. Fights were one round and these were big, huge heavyweights that were fighting 12 and 15 rounds just, you know, just a month before, six months before. And now all of a sudden they can't make it, you know, 90 seconds. Yeah. With Mike Tyson was crazy. Crazy. And that was the stuff we grew up with. I remember turning on fight night with my dad, whatever it was, and we put it on, getting all excited, and the fight was over before it yeah, started. It's like, what the and hell? they were screaming at me, get in here, get in here, you're gonna miss it. And you're thinking, what are you talking about? Then you come in all of a sudden, boom, it was down. Yeah. And you're thinking, that's it? Yeah. And that happened, I mean, I don't know, you know, 20 fights. And like all Ali, he was he won a lot of fights. He didn't win in devastating fashion like that. There are a lot of his fights went the distance or nine, 10 rounds. He was in awesome shape. He floated around and, and, and I just, I don't know. I peep that is always going to be a question in American sports. Well, you know it's what people will Tyson, say, it's Ali. Tyson, Ali, I just got to say after watching those two growing up and being around them and seeing, you know, the different type of uh, energy systems they had, the, the way they went on the attack. I mean, uh, Ali was one of the most beautifully gifted, talented, you know, just, just, just the, everything he did so, so well as an athlete. Tyson was just violent and destructive and, and threw everything with enough power to knock you out. And I think that's the difference. I don't know. I mean, if I had to bet on it, if we were here right now and you said, who do you bet on? I bet on Tyson. And that, and that brings up the, the unified, most aggravating question in sports to me personally sure. is <laughs> what the hell happened with Douglas and then McNeely and that joke and then the Holyfield deals. And then like, it's like he lost his instinct. He lost that Viper, that, that killer instinct that he would go into that ring with. It was gone. And he admitted it. He's, he, he, he was gone. He was not a fighter anymore. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, you know, the pressure, I mean, you see this with a lot of these guys. You see this a lot of from MMA guys to boxing guys, they get in the pressure, they get the money. When you're all of a sudden got 50 million bucks in a bank account or wherever it's at, so you start doing things differently. And I've been told numerous times that the Buster Douglas thing was, you know, again, Mike's management, Mike's team, they put him in a bad spot on purpose. He hadn't been training. He had been partying. He wasn't even supposed to have, it, have to have that fight. And it just happened so quickly that he couldn't get back in front of it. And I mean, I, I've seen it. I've personally, again, firsthand experience with some of the biggest and brightest stars in the fighting industry. I've seen it. It definitely happens, man. You get ahead of yourself a little bit. You don't, you know, you don't stay consistent with your training. All the things you did to get there, all the stuff that you had to do every day to stay disciplined, to stay in your routine, you stop and you break that up a little bit and you get a loss. And the, the thing that I love the most about the memories is that all I picture is that DVD or that C, what, I, what do you call them? VHS yeah. of Mike Tyson's greatest hits. Oh yeah. I picture that the, 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 like there's this company out there right now called the roots of the fight. You've seen this apparel company, yep. just awesome. And they got the coolest pictures of him jump roping in Brooklyn and custom auto standing there. And my memories of Mike Tyson, are the ones that I want to keep personally and selfishly, I don't, I, I know about the Buster Douglas and the Evander Holyfield and the year and everything that happened, but I don't even, None of that even matters. To me, that was just like this whole downfall, downward spiral of, of a true champion that 
I don't think anybody at 19 years old can manage that. You see it all the time in basketball, whatever it is. At 19 years old, me and you are going into a college campus and we're spending our mom and dad's money on 21 or 18 credits. And this guy is selling out Madison Square Garden and flying all over the world in private jets and buying mansions in the Catskills and buying uh, Bentleys and Rolls Royces at 20 years old. It's not normal. And I don't think it's fair to say, good for him, he lost. I hate that anal- I hate that attitude in America. What about what it took to achieve that? That's what people don't understand is how hard it is, the pressure that's on a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old kid that never, he didn't even have an education. He had nothing coming up. What, what he did, what he achieved, where he came from, is uh, that in, in itself is the most impressive story. And then he became the youngest champion. And then he became the youngest unified champion. I mean, it's just, the whole story is impressive and incredible. And you're friends with him. And that's cool to me. Like, I've been asking you forever to introduce yeah. I just want to meet him. Like, you don't get star. I don't get starstruck. I've no. met some of my heroes, George Brett, Willie Nelson. I've met people that I'm like, man, I, I'd like to meet that guy. I, I've met a lot of celebrities. I, I'm not saying that like, wow, wow. I'm just saying they're just people. Yeah. But to me, Tyson's an icon, man. He's a guy that you got to get. You gotta, he got to be around him. He's got to be around you a little bit before he warms up. Otherwise, he's just kind of quiet and oh, just kind of shy. But once he gets in a good mood... And once he's comfortable with you, you're dealing with one of the funniest, nicest, like quick, quick, quick witted, you know, sarcastic coming up with stuff. He's just a funny, good guy. Like, like anyone else. He just, he just has a new appreciation and respect for life. He really does. I don't know if it's a second chance, but he's like, you know what? I've been there. I've had everything and I couldn't make it work with that. Now I care about my family and my friends and my businesses. He's got a great wife, Kiki. is an amazing person. So he's really got, and, and her brother, Rob Hickman, there's a great group of people around him right now. So Mike, the sky's the limit for Mike right now, I'll tell you that. I mean, he's really, like you said, whether it's a second chance, he's coming into it. He's got a lot of supporters, a lot of guys like us, a lot of people that grew up watching Mike Tyson and are the biggest you know, supporters and friends and fans of his. Now he's starting to do uh, work outside of, the, outside of boxing in different areas, and that's really a cool thing. And I love seeing that. I, I, you know, like when he punched Ed Helms in the hangover, <laughs> hilarious, but so like perfect that it's the, the way they set that up is that Mike Tyson was Mike Tyson in that just laid back and then honoring. And then the pictures you see with him with Cody, no love and these champions in the UFC. And I know no, look, Cody's getting ready to fight TJ again. And, and Mike is so respected by Dana White. And he was by the Fertitas. And he's always, he's always there to lend a helping hand to these fighters. Maybe not to say, hey, I'm not here to teach you jiu-jitsu. I'm here to teach you about discipline and what it takes to, if you get on top, to stay on top. And there's just so many life lessons I've learned by reading the books, by listening to, this, to his interviews, and by watching the documentaries. I think that he is an American icon. I truly do. I truly he feel is. he's important to American history in way more ways than knocking people out. So you... you are on campus at the old Hans gym by campus, University of Nevada, Reno, about 1994, 1995. And you're a walk on at 19 years old. You've never had your wrist taped. You've never put on a 10 or a 12 ounce glove at that time. You get in there. You, what's next? Take me through it. You're, you're a freshman walk on. You've, you weren't recruited out. You've never even fought. So now all of a sudden you're fighting for a spot on the team. How does it work out? Well, you know, like I just said, I mean, I don't, I mean it truthfully. It's just something I could do. I can't really explain other than just saying I could see stuff. It slowed down for me. I was able to get the point system real quick. And I actually went to nationals that first year. I won the regionals. I beat a kid who, you know, had won the regionals for Cal Berkeley two years in a row. He was supposed to be the guy going to nationals from the West. We also have Air Force Academy in our division. So they're a perennial powerhouse. They are not an easy team to beat. Every year, in order to qualify for the, for the regionals, you have to win the win, wing open in the Air Force Academy, which is a huge, huge tournament. And everybody there has to box. So the academies get to get a pool of, a, you know, 150 more people to choose from. We get walk-ons, guys like Joey Gilbert from Minogue that's never thrown a punch before versus these guys that are taking boxing mandatory from when the, from when the second they walk in, you know, to one of the academies. So, you know, it was, it was really interesting. I hadn't fought before. Um, got in there, learned how to learn the point system and end up just winning. Won that first regionals. Um, tried to win the nationals. Broke my nose in the regional tournament. Had it fractured again, the first fight of the national tournament. And... The actual only loss I ever suffered, and it wasn't a loss, it was a medical disqualification, was my, my first year boxing at the University of Nevada. Because I was bleeding so much, they stopped that fight. So that was the only fight or the only loss I ever suffered as an amateur. I never lost an amateur fight. I had a fight stop for blood. That next year, I dedicated myself to it and just said, I want to win a title. And 
I ended up never losing a fight in college. You know, won all my fights by either knockout or really, really convincingly. Was twice named the outstanding boxer of the NCAA Nationals, which was awesome. A huge, huge um, compliment there. And then what happened is I joined the Air Force. I actually went to the Air National Guard and I went to Air Force basic training and I wasn't going to box anymore after that. And at Air Force basic training in, in, uh, in Lackland Air Force Base, uh, they grabbed, um, uh, you know, I went over and did a little sparring at Kelly Air Force Base. They wanted me to sign a four-year commitment to box for Army Air Force. I called the old man back home, ran it by him. He said, negative, son. <laughs> You're going to law school. If you want to box so bad, then you can do it while you go to law school. You know, you, you know do, it, do it just like you did in college. So I did. And that's actually what happened. I came back from Air Force basic training. Um, there was the golden gloves coming up. And my coach, another, this, the whole thing with me, don't, don't bet me, I can't do something. Coach uh, Martino actually said to me, you know, listen, open amateurs is a different deal. You know, it's not college. You won't do so well in the open amateurs. You'll get killed. And I just, as soon as he said that, I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I, I never fought an open amateur fight. I enroll in the, uh, the, the Golden Gloves. I go down. I'm the only fighter that has to fight three nights in a row. And I win the Golden Gloves for Nevada. Um, after that, I win the regionals for Golden Gloves. Break my nose again. I got a bad beak. And I can't fight in the national Golden Gloves. So what they I did. won't release you? No. <laughs> I say that, the beak. I got a bad beak. My nose is all jacked up. Yeah, so, so, the, so why couldn't you fight the Nationals? They wouldn't release you? They wouldn't medical? release me. Yeah, medical. Medical. It was a broken, fractured so nose. So you came in and won the Nevada Gold Gloves. Then you went to the regional, won the regional. And then the doctor says, no, you can't go. I bet you well, were just pissed. I broke it at the regionals. I knew. They looked at me and said, you're, you're, you can't fight anymore. The thing was just, I'd have, I've had four septoplasties now where they go in and fix your septum. Um, Jesse Brinkley rearranged it for me in the last one. And so, and I definitely do for another, but what, what, what just went down was that, you know, like I said, um, I, I was able to learn how cool of a career you say it in, in passing or in just, but I mean, there again, it's not what you, you, you say, you talk about it like it's easy, but just jump roping for two minutes is freaking it's hard. hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and to go into a ring and to get your ass kicked and your nose broken and still win the regional thing where you have to go get a surgery to fix your nose after that is, that's the hardest thing to do in sports. It's oh, got sure. to be, it's got to be. It's not, it's definitely not a great feeling, you know, fighting with a broken nose, fighting with broken ribs, fighting, I mean, a fighter never is a hundred percent. I mean, that just is a fact. Everyone knows as an athlete, you're very rarely 100%. I don't even know what that is. You're always playing, fighting, competing, you know, performing with an injury or something that's, you know, inhibiting you in some, in some sense. So you just got to adapt and fight through it. And again, that goes right back to where you're at now in your life. And what we do as human beings at our age is that, Ad adapting and being able to, if you go to work and your girlfriend broke up with you, or you might have somebody that's ill in the family, or you might have just wrecked a car, or your daughter might have just got kicked out of a class. There's so many things that happen in life that throw curveballs at you. That adapting is a key. Adapting is everything. And I, boxing I truly teaches you to adapt. A boxing, but almost any sport. Again, any taking sport. it back to what we talked about earlier, adapting to circumstances that aren't as you practiced or aren't as you planned. That's what life's about. Life is never just going to serve you up that cherry. You know that that easy little soft pitch. Life is that ripping fastball whatever it is i don't play i didn't play baseball change up hardest change up i mean just whatever the hell it is like you said if that is the hardest thing i believe it because hitting that fastball from a from a from a you know a professional pitcher would be insane yeah. you know what i'm saying that's what life's all about life is about you plan you prepare but then it throws you a curveball how do you adapt to that so how do you adapt when your nose is destroyed and you're bleeding like a sieve and you still have rounds to go and the bell's ringing and the doctor's looking at you and the cut man's looking at you and they're saying he's good to go. You're like, there's no way I'm quitting this fight. I watched it personally yeah. in, the, in the Brinkley fight. They sh in my opinion, I was like, Gilbert, you're a freaking idiot for yeah, continuing this fight. And Jesse got the better, best of you that. But he here's did. the deal is that after the fight was done, the talk was about Joey Gilbert is a freaking savage like yeah. you would not lay down and i kept looking at your dad that night and i'm like what's going through this man's head right now joey's your family i'm like you i know i've talked to enough fighters like chad mendez when his wife is when he just fought in boise last week congrats on the win my brother he says his wife hates being there she closes her eyes and she's so yeah. nervous so your family, family did that. so when you look in the ring and you see your son battered like that you don't want to just look at your parents and say, hey, guys, I'm going to quit for you? No way, man. You know what's funny is, like you just said, um, break your nose. I broke my nose in the fifth round. I had to fight seven more, nows with a broke, seven more rounds with a broken nose. I lost more blood in that fight. And true story is I walked in that ring weighing 162. When we got back to the hotel that night, after I got released from the hospital, I was 151 pounds. I lost pounds. almost 11 pounds between blood and sweat in that 12-round fight. And, I mean, everyone saw that. There was blood everywhere. But... 
The, the doctor kept asking me a freaking question. I just had a problem morally in my heart answer. He kept saying, can you continue? Can you continue? That's with a C. Not do you want to continue? Do you prefer, can you continue? And for me as a fighter, and any athlete knows what I'm talking about there, you only got one person to answer to when, the, when that dark moment was out there. And as Sugar Ray Leonard said, when you're in that dark dungeon, that dark hole, and you're deciding whether or not you're going to come out, there's only one person you're talking to, and that's yourself. And I knew I'd have to answer to myself moving forward for the rest of my life. Could I continue? Damn it, yes, I could. You know, it wasn't you pretty. Might not want to. It wasn't <laughs> fun. It didn't feel good. Every time he hit me with a little jab on the nose, I felt the lightning bolt shoot out my eye, and I felt like my nutsack, to be honest with you. Every time a punch hit me, I wanted to take a knee and go to my happy place. But damn it, I did not want to quit, and I didn't want him, a guy who's still a, one of my best friends of this day, saying, you quit. I made you quit. Yeah. I knew that would have happened, and I just bit down and got through that seven rounds. And, and, and again, it's like when that fight was over and I went back to the El Dorado and I'm talking to Tony and, and, and Revilio and everybody, I'm like, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, like yeah. they're in the picture that came out of you in the paper the next day. Oh, it was, it just said, it was said, I, I have it here yeah. somewhere. Cause I was like, that guy, he went all, he went all 12 rounds. Yeah. To me, that's a victory. I mean, Jesse did get the best of you. We're going to get to Brinkley in a little bit. I saw him not too long ago to Ducks Unlimited <laughs> dinner. I love Jesse too. I don't know him like you do, but he was a stout. He was a warrior. When you talk about a fight like that, Gilbert, what comes to mind in the professional, um, besides your professional career, the the trilogy between Gotti and Ward. Oh, yeah. And I think when you got to be around a pretty serious fight, I feel like my brother Clint, he's really he's really quiet, He's but he's a fight fan. And he that trilogy is some of the best fights to watch. They've made, they've made movies about it. That's one of those fights to where at any given second, those guys could have took a knee and went to their happy yep. place. And most people would be like, good for him, great fight. But they went and they went and they went. It pays off in their mind. It paid off in their mind. Maybe not financially, maybe not economically, but emotionally as a fighter. And as it, it pertains to life, those guys taught the world something that, hey, respect is first. But when we're in this ring and we're competitors, we're going at it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we started this conversation is that there's nothing wrong with kicking somebody's ass and winning and calling yourself a champion. There's nothing wrong with losing and looking at the champion and saying, congrats, but next time I'm going to get you. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to get back to. I want you to talk about as a fighter, when you watch a fight like that, does it, does it make you want to strive to get into a fight like that? I know you want to end a fight fast, but is there something about that 12 round brawl with oh, Brinkley yeah. or that Gotti, that Gotti, that Arturo Gotti and Mickey Ward trilogy? Those are wars. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from our military, but those are ring wars for boxing. Those, those are your ultimate, the whole terminology, the whole, that whole saying, mano y mano. That is just stand up, put your foot on mine. You're drawing that imaginary line. You're saying, who's going to go first? It's all about a game. You know, it's just, it's just who's going to, who's going to, who's going to, who's going to cave in first. It's a war of attrition. And those are the, those are the greatest fights with Brinkley. I knew that night it was going to be who was either going to quit first or who was going to get stopped, you know, and I was never going to get stopped and I sure as hell wasn't quitting. So, I mean, those are the best fights. You know, when you look at those fights and that's truly what it is, there is such an amount of mutual respect. You both, you know, know each other are, are hardworking, know each other deserve it, know each other want to win it, but you're not giving an inch. And I think those are the most beautiful fights. You know, those guys had such a great respect for each other, but they didn't give each other an inch. They, from every bell, from every second in that, from bell to bell, they tried to knock each other out every freaking second of those, of those rounds. And when you, when you do some due diligence and you watch the history of that trilogy and the, the communities that these guys were from and where they trained and their backing as far as their support systems, the local pubs, you sure. know, you know, that you talking about these guys that were drinking beer and Guinnesses and, and would die for Mickey Ward. They would literally take a bullet for, for Mickey sure. Ward. Yeah. And then you got the, the, the Italian side of Arturo Gotti that was like literally maybe a real life Rocky story, yep. the, the way that he trained and the way he punched me. I mean, he did things that Balboa wrote in his movies, which we're going to get to Balboa for sure, because you're personal friends with him too, which is another way, way beyond American icon. In my opinion, that guy's sure. amazing. But that trilogy with those two is something that I watch and I watched the Roy Jones Jr. And the James Tony and the sweet tea, sweet pea and the marvelous Marvin Hagler and the sugar. And I love Hagler and I love Hearns and I love all, there's so many good fighters. Where did it go? We want to get to that too. There's going to be more podcasts because I miss boxing. I know that you got a pretty good thumb on it still. I don't. Um, that trilogy though, is it something that you would argue as a fight fan or as a, as, a, as a guy that understands boxing? Would you say that that's what boxing has lost? 
that there's really not that kind of awareness anymore of respect. And that now it's like you see somebody that's 41 and 0 or 21 and 0 that gets in that ring and they're not fighting somebody that should be in the ring. I don't know. I don't have my thumb on it. To me, that's what boxing was. Is that what it lost? Is, is it just luster that it lost or did it lose that, that, that mystique of the respect of somebody like the Gotti and, and the wards? You know, I think boxing is still great. I mean, I think boxing's still in a great place. I don't agree that, that MMA killed it. I still think that there's boxers that make, you know, in one fight with some of these guys making their entire career in MMA in the UFC. And that's, that's just a fact. Um, I think, I do think that we've suffered from, you know, some, some difference of opinion. I think that you've got guys that are more about the money. You've got the Floyd Mayweathers out there. You've got the Al Heymans out there. You've got, you know, obviously, you know, the different guys from top rank. I don't, I don't want to say any, any names, but um, there's a lot of people out there that are businessmen too. So a lot of it's been some of the upper echelon of the sport and what they do. Um, I think we still got, I still think you've got the hungriest fighters out there. I still think you've got the best stories out there. I think that we've had a heavyweight problem in America. Everyone knows that. We haven't had heavyweight yeah, fighters. You just say we have an obesity problem we, in our country. <laughs> we have a heavyweight. We have a heavyweight problem. We haven't had a heavyweight, and you know now. now let's let's see what Wilder does. But it's been it's been I think lack of talent. I think there's just been a lot happening. I think I think that the MMA game, UFC in general, sucked a lot of great athletes that might have you know that might have come gone into boxing that went into UFC. I really don't know the answer, but when I look at it as a fight fan and I look at it as a, as a as a boxing enthusiast, someone that really loves the sport. I really don't see what everyone's talking about. I still think that the top, the biggest fights are, 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 are that, are the biggest fights, and they're that exciting. When you can put 40,000 people in a stadium in Texas, when you could put 50,000, 60,000 people in a stadium in the UK, I don't think boxing's died. I don't think it's gone anywhere. And so I think that, you know, we've, we've, we're lacking some of those great fighters, those guys that had those trilogies. You know, the Barrera Morales, if you remember some oh, of those fights, oh, those were God. incredible. But I think, you know, it's just, it's just a generation. I think it's going to come. I think this next set of fighters are up and coming. I think we're going to see those great fights again. Who, who would you say right now, just give me the, the three faces of boxing. It doesn't matter weight division right now. Who are they? I think you got Triple G. I think you got the Charlo brothers. I think you've got, um, you know, the heavyweights, Deontay Wilder. You know, that's, that's, that's what I'm looking at. I'm seeing, you know, you, you've got some like Mikey Garcia. You've got some guys out there lingering that are, that are good that I think are going to be great. You know, I mean, but Triple G, you know, Canelo, those guys aren't going anywhere. You know, I mean, they're not going anywhere. And I still think they are the top of the sport right now. you got like that Javante Davis. you got a few up-and-comers. We'll see. You know, we remember everybody remembers, uh, uh, what is his name, uh, Adrian Broner, about billions. He was a total dud you know what i'm saying here's a guy that you know super talented but no work ethic you know no no none of that uh, discipline and sacrifice missing so a lot of it's just i think again generational i think these guys up and coming right now and the guys that that just slid into the spot behind some of the floyds and them i just don't think they were willing to work as hard and i think that they're going to get their lunch taken and then they're gonna have to come back and work hard do you think that pacquiao should have fought again hell yeah he's a fighter he doesn't want to do anything else I think those guys, I mean, there's nothing better that Manio does better than fighting. I mean, and, and, he's, and you saw what he just did to Matisse. I mean, he whooped his butt. So I don't think, and you saw what he did, Matisse did to Mayweather. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, again, styles make fights. Uh, just because someone's record is this or they haven't fought that, those top upper echelon guys, they're always going to give each other problems. And I think they're going to be entertaining till the end. So you get out of the operating room with, a, with this nose surgery after <laughs> the regional Golden Gloves. And you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Your, mm -hmm. your, yeah. your career is being woven in. A, a sure. bo boxing to me is an amazing lifestyle. And what you achieved is amazing. You get out of bed in the hospital after this second or third nose operation. You just got told you can't go to nationals for golden gloves. You just won the state and the regional. And your dad's telling you you're going to, to law school. But you say, I'm going to become pro. How's, now, now what happens? I actually didn't have it fixed after I had it fixed after my college career. And then I wasn't fighting anymore. And I went to the, you know, went to the air force and came back, had that, you know, went and fought in the golden gloves, got it broke. I decided not to have it fixed surgically because I would have been out for six months. I decided to then turn pro and have my pro debut in July on Mills Lane's card here at Harris here in Reno. So I was at the Harris casino made my, pre my that was my, that was my, uh, that was my se second option was okay. I can have this surgery and try and, you know, try and, you know, go and go to the Olympics or go to Olympic trials or because of the year, because I'm so far back, I just turned pro. I actually didn't think I'd love, I'd like fighting professionally as much as I did. 
So I had the pro fight just because I wanted to have it. I felt I felt like everybody talks a lot of game. You know, got all these people. I was going to be a fighter. I was going to do this. I thought, you know what? I want to try it. And it was when I had that pro fight that I just absolutely got bit. And I got bit by the bug. And I remember coming. I mean, I dusted that guy in two rounds. And I remember going to my dad and saying, Dad, you know, that was when I said to him, hey, I'm, I want to fight professionally. And that's when he said, negative, son. You know, you want you need to go to law school. We didn't work this hard through college. And I thought you were done boxing in college. You know, what do you mean you're going to, you don't want to go to law school. That's what we worked so hard for. And I, and so I took his advice and I went to law school. And what's funny is, so I go from the regional tournament, have my pro debut, fight a guy. I'm bit. I want to fight professionally, but I've got law school starting in a month and a half. So what I do is I go down to San Diego. I find a gym, City Boxing. If you go down to San Diego, people still know about City Boxing. I get in there and I spend the next two summers going to Mexico City, taking the metro by myself into the deepest dark is a gym called Ponchos Rosales and learning how to punch to the body like, like you can only learn in Mexico. And I swear to God, I credit that for my career, for learning how to come back and really be an effective body puncher. And while all my friends did you know, internships with judges or clerking somewhere, I went to Mexico and learned how to spar and fight the toughest, the toughest guys in the business, hands down. So you're, you're going from San Diego to Mexico City? Yeah. On the tram? Uh, no, I, I flew down. I flew from San Diego, Mexico City, and then took jumped on a, a metro and took it to an undisclosed address. Someone they gave me a piece. A guy named Pepe Morales, who was the two-time manager of the year in all Mexico for fighters. He actually managed a guy named uh, uh, the El Jaguar. Uh, um, what was his last name? Tony, Tony, Tony El Jaguar. Aguirre, excuse me, Aguirre. It was El Jaguar Aguirre. He was a straw weight, like a 105-pounder. This guy, uh, Morales, managed him. I met him in San Diego. He invited me down. He said, in the 25 years of inviting guys down, I was the only gringo that ever came down. And I went down there, and I was there for two months each summer. And it was, again, I'm sitting here today and accomplished what I accomplished on the contender and the sports, you know, the stuff I did because I went to Mexico City. For Does those Pops know you're going to Mexico City this yeah, time? Yeah, my whole family knew. They knew you were doing it. Well, I had internships back here in the DA's office and with judges that wrote my letters of recommendation for law school. And I actually came back and started a little internship in the DA's office. And they, they brought me in this stack of files and stacked it up and just basically told me, you're gonna do this. And I said, that's basically like busy work, right? And he goes, yeah, so? And I just thought to myself, screw that. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and move papers all summer. I actually bought the flight, flew back to San Diego, got my stuff and flew to Mexico City. And you're one and oh as a professional at this time. One and oh as a professional. And you're in Mexico and City I, learning how to punch to the body like Cesar <laughs> Chavez yeah. and De La Hoya and Morales and all these guys that would just break your ribs. I actually and, was in the gym, the same gym that, that Barrera was in. Barrera was in. Yeah. Who was unbelievable. And believe it or not, there is an Asian guy in there that used to hold the mitts for him. He was, if you go back and look at some of the videos, and the guy, when I get to this, I'm in Mexico City, this guy walks in wearing a Nevada boxing shirt, and I almost fall over, and it was because of this whole connection with Barrera and Mills Lane's card. And, and he fought on Mills Lane's card here. And that someone gave him a Nevada boxing shirt from the commission here. And this guy's wearing it in this gym, Ponchos Rosales in Mexico City. I walk in, being a Nevada boxer, three-time national champ, four-time All-American. And I walk in, I'm like, what the hell? This guy's got a Nevada boxing shirt on. And we all became friends. And then I found out that these guys tried to do this thing it's called round robin. They left me in the ring for about 12 rounds and every two rounds a new guy got in and beat the absolute hell out of me. I was bleeding out of my lip, I was bleeding out of my eye, I was bleeding out of my nose and I actually had blood from my ear. We didn't know how, how good that was. <laughs> but I found out after that that those guys, they wanted to see if I'd quit. And because I didn't quit, so at the end of this 12 rounds, everybody comes walking back in the gym and they all start clapping. And I'm thinking, whoa, Jesus, man, no, what? this is not good. Then they clapped and they said, you know, something Hermano, like you're a brother, you know, you're a brother, this and that. And when I found out, I said to, to Pepe, I said, what? what's going on? He said, they, they tried to see if you'd quit. And because you didn't quit, they want to take you to dinner. And they all took me out. I became the greatest friends with these guys. And so this just, is kind of like the overlying theme of your entire boxing yeah, career. Is pretty much. Get the shit beat out of you. And, and see prove if I your, quit. prove yourself. Yeah. And it turned into what, what we're going to get to, but... I want to, I want to, I don't want to piss you off by saying this, but it's no secret. Like I've heard Joey Gilbert's an ass. Joey Gilbert's arrogant when you were boxing. And I'm like, no, I know Joey. And I never put you on that level of arrogance. I always put you on a level of, if he's not thinking he's the best, then he's going to, he's not going to sneak to Mexico and do that for two months at a time. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get four nose operations and stay in there for a 12 round fight against Jesse Brinkley. You got, talk to me a little bit, because I want to transition into Mayweather Jr. And I want to talk about, what arrogance really is and what confidence is and 
you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. When Joey Gilbert was at the top of his game and he walked into a place and I, I witnessed it, whether it was into a club or a restaurant or a local pub or a news station or an interview or a gym, you were the showcase. You were the limelight. You had the spotlight on you. And people be like, arrogance. He's always got to have the limelight. But then when you'd go into a place and you were quiet and subdued and you just say to yourself, now you're an arrogant Not, yeah. prick that doesn't oh, talk dude. to anybody. Yeah. And it, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I know you on a level to where me and you'll give each other crap all day long and we have that mutual respect. So when I hear it, I let it go in one ear and out the other because I understand where you're coming from. Talk to me though the importance of your attitude and your approach. I know you're cocky. And I want you to, you got to be, you have to you have, have to you, 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 you can't go get your ass whipped like that. And not no be. way in that sport in the, in the, in the fight game, you either better believe in yourself and have that little cocky edge or you ain't going to get anywhere. I mean, I truly, truly feel that, but you know, like they say though, Chad, attitude really is everything. Attitude is everything. The attitude you bring to, any, to wherever you're going is everything. And I really do. I really do believe that is so important. And so did I always, did I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder at times? Absolutely. But what you said is probably the most important thing. Is most probably the most prolific. I would practice that. There would be some days I'd say, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm I'm chipper and I'm I'm really saying hi to everybody. And still, there was a guy I, I didn't say hi right, or I, or I was too I was too energetic. And Joey Gilbert's all over the place, man. And what's up with that guy? You know, you're like, what the hell? Then there were the times where I felt like you know, someone asked me a question. So hey, Joey, you're at a dinner table. And you're just coming back from a USO tour. I was just in Afghanistan and Iraq with a bunch of NFL players and Jessica Simpson and, and all these other people. And someone says, so, hey, Joey, you know, so how are things? You're kind of like, I'd sit there for a second thinking, should I even answer this question right now? Because I'm just going to say something. And so I'd say, oh, things are cool, man. Yeah, just, you would have taken the attention training. off of everybody. And I did. And so what happened is, this, say you got a guy keeps pressing you. You know, so what, did Joey, I thought you just, weren't you just like overseas or something? I'm like, yeah, man, I, I did a USO tour. It was really cool, man. I went and saw our troops. It was really an awesome thing, man. Total lot of respect for those guys. Just tell me about it, man. Like, what else, who'd you go there with? And so then by the time we're done, well, I went with John Cena and there's other these guys here and, you know, you know Tom Brady, you know, this, you start naming all these crazy people and they look at you like you're either lying or you're full of shit or you're dropping names to be again. You're like, you can't win. You can't win. So, I mean, it really is damned if you do, damned if you don't. I remember saying to, to my significant other one time, Molly, I said, you know what's so funny is, First of all, she hates to go to dinner any with me, just like you said, because you walk out somewhere, you know everybody. Yeah. So you, you go try and sit in a Pinocchio's here in town, or you go to the El Dorado and sit in Bistro, and every 15 feet, someone's going to turn, hey, Joey, hey, Joey. And so you know, you don't like it, but then it was that one time where you're, you're trying to be, be low-key, and you don't want to come across as whatever, and someone you know, comes over to you, and you're trying to be you know, respectful to where you're at dinner with, so you just try to say, oh, and that person goes and MFs you all around town, that you're a cocky guy, you're too cool for him, you big lead him, you didn't even say but two words to him, and you're thinking, you know, it's just not fair. It's, but yeah, that, I do think attitude is everything, though, Chad. I, 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 and what you're saying, it, it, it rings true on so many levels to where... I, I've been around like what, what you're talking about. I remember going to the contender final. I want to get in the contenders. And I remember seeing you walk into the arena and it looked like it looked, I, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, the, the, the most like Michael Jackson coming yeah. out of a concert it and was it was insane. just, you were hoarded. And I was like, that's cool for a minute. <laughs> right because then you're going remember Stallone you, telling me that remember it's cool for me. And I've, and I, I deal with it on a much smaller level. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it is that when somebody asked me, Hey, what'd you do last week? And I'm like, um, I don't, I don't know if I should really say this because then it's going to be like what you're saying. It's going to take up all the big and shot. I, and, you know. and, and, and I don't want to be that guy. I want to share those experiences and I want people, but I, I'm humbled to get to do the things that I do. And I know that you were too. And that's why I bring up words like cocky or arrogant or that you always got to have the limelight on you and you're a name. I'm not a name dropper. I'm, you weren't a name dropper. They asked you who you went to freaking Afghanistan yeah. with. Yeah. If you don't want to know, what do you want me to say? I went with John and Jerry. You don't want to know that it's John Cena and Jerry Lee Lewis. You you know, like yeah. they're celebrities. Oh, sure. That's that's who I went with. You got it out of me. If you didn't want me to be the life of the party or have all the showcasing and attention on me, then just ask the girl next to me what she did last weekend. And to me, that's fair. So when you see this celebrity, and I, I've been out in people and seen how they get attacked, and I'm like, yeah, sometimes I probably would get a little bit of an attitude. Yeah. Like, hey, not today. And then as soon as Michael Jordan or somebody says no pictures today, what front is Front page of the paper, front nine paper. pictures to the one fan, you know, the disabled yeah. fan. It's just, it happens every time. It happens every, every time. time. And it's just so sad that people can't go, you know what? We're lucky to live in a country that we have what we call celebrity. Because in there's some places that it doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. And that's where I, I, I just, I, I want to get that message out there that 
in life, attitude is everything. When I wake up in the morning, whether I get four hours of sleep or eight hours and I roll out of bed, I know that I'm going to stomp the piss out of the world that day. Mm -hmm. And if people want to look at me and say, you're an idiot for thinking like that, well, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But I want to kick ass daily. I want to treat people with respect. I want to get things done. And I want to look back on it and go, Hey, that's because of hard work and elbow grease and sweat equity. I wasn't, I didn't inherit anything. You didn't yeah. inherit anything. You weren't just given this belt by Don King and say, hey, go wear this. You're the champion of the world. You had to go to Mexico and almost die on a tram and go into these neighborhoods that you probably shouldn't have been in. You had to, get, sure. you had to go under the knife several times. You had to cut weight. You had to diet. You had to, there were so many sacrifices that celebrities or champions or millionaires or Rick Revilio's. Nobody understands what Rick Revilio does to get to where he has no. in life. And if you break it down, there's a science of success. There is a true science of it. And I really wanted to touch on that because I still hear to this day, Joey Gilbert. So I'm like, no, he's not. He's freaking awesome. He's with his daughter all the time. He's ma he's building a badass business. He trains his butt off every day. Still, he stays in shape. He's vain as hell, just like I am. At 42 years old, you don't want to look yeah. bad. No, I want to look in the mirror and go, "Hey, I'm doing everything I can to look like this." Well, you know, Ch I think that the one important thing I got to say is that I don't mean to stop you. Is that I used to say as an athlete something I read one time that there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence, and I got to walk and you walk it like a tightrope. And that's truly what it is. And if I had to say one thing about the younger athlete, Joey Gilbert, to where you are now, you just learn how to do that a little better. Maybe you learn not to be, as, maybe to come in as, as so much of a big shot. But even then, you're just louder when you're younger. You're, you're bolder when you're younger. You move faster when you're younger. I think as you get older, you get a little more mindful. You think about things. You think about your effect on people, everything you do, not just your actions, but your words. I think you're a little bit more calculated. But other than that, I think you, if you don't wake up every day with the sense that you're going to make that, you know, make that day your, your, your bitch, you're going to be in trouble. In I mean, trouble. truthfully, you got to wake up every morning. If you remember the movie Jerry Maguire, clap your hands and say, today's going to be a great day and I'm going to spank its ass. And I truly, like, there isn't a day I don't get up. I used to tell my, tell my daughter this. If daddy puts his feet on the floor in the morning, we're going to have a good day. I just got to swing those feet out of bed, touch them to the floor, because as soon as they touch the floor, my body takes over. It's in a routine. It knows, get up, go hard. Yeah. Get up, go hard. You know, you don't take no for an answer. We're not going to give in. We're not going to quit. We're just going to keep going. And if it gets tough, we're going to punch harder. That's and, truly it. And, and keep forward momentum. Keep moving. That's and, what I mean. Keep moving forward. Keep, moving. keep punching. And, you know... You, there's things that I look at, you know, when I watch in the gym, when I watch you with, when we're trained, I, I find motivation in the littlest things. And I think that what you're talking about in life of, of keeping things moving forward, if somebody could learn what motivation really is and that it doesn't take a whole bunch, you don't need to go watch the, a three hour movie to be motivated. Mm -hmm. when, when I see you do an extra set of abs or I see Matt do 15 pull-ups when I can only do seven. I find motivation in the littlest things in life now. And I think that the secret of it, of what you're saying is I was the same way brasher when I started in this business and would say things and, and, and wasn't as well-rounded. Axl Rose broke up the greatest band in rock and roll history because of attitude and not being well-rounded. But here they are 20 years later making the most money out of any band in American history yeah. pretty much. And now Axl and Slash and everybody gets along because they've matured and they understand, hey, Let's just, let's just be friends and let's get along and let's go out and entertain people and make money. And they're doing it. And I think that the sooner you can learn that in life, because I know people that are 45, 50, 55, 60 that aren't learning it and they don't wake up with that attitude every day. And I think the longer it goes, the further you fall behind, the harder it ever is going to be to get there. I think the secret is going from those 20s and those 30s and transitioning into those mid 30s and early 40s of saying, hey, I'm going to find motivation in the littlest things today to go and kick ass. I'm going to make sure that I hug my daughter better than I've ever hugged her before. I'm going to make sure that I over-exaggerate that hug. I'm going to do things better today than I did yesterday. And our buddy, our good buddy, one of our best friends, Matt Pandola, who's a huge, huge motivation to both of us and one of your best friends in training and everything through your career, he says it every day, find that better version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And listen, about your career now, you are literally telling me that you're one and oh in Mexico learning how to body punch and that you were the only quote unquote gringo that ever took him up on his invite. And then people have the audacity to say that you're a cocky prick. That's what I'm trying to say is that there's no, he's not, they don't you know. don't know that they he was doing know. that. You didn't I think do that's that. one of the biggest things though, Chad is most people that say something like that, whether it's about you or me, that person hasn't taken five minutes to come up and have a conversation with you. Cause if they did that, they wouldn't feel like that. I've never had a person that's actually met me, spent five minutes with me, walk away and say, that guy's a jerk. That guy's a, a cocky motherfucker. They, they usually say, wow, man, 
It was crazy talking to Joey Gilbert. He's a normal guy. Or, hey, man, I didn't realize he's, he's, he's just down to earth guy. He does the same thing I do. You're like, yeah, man, how do you think I got here? Yeah. I didn't do anything different than any other successful guy did. I got up every day. I worked hard. I found something I wasn't good at. I got better at it. You know what? I improved. That's why we have coaches. That's why we have journaling. That's why we do what we do. It's all about getting better, man. It's all every about day. doing better every, every day. day. And the people that say I can't learn anything from Joe Gilbert or I can't get motivated by somebody like Matt Pandola, I sit there and go, dude, Come and watch Matt Pendola train at 43 years old and tell me that you don't, or 44, 45. Well, he's 45 now. Yeah, tell me that you're not going to go home and look in the, he's old. <laughs> tell me you're not going to go home and look in the mirror and go, man, I'm, I'm motivated. Now, look, I don't want to look just like Matt. I, I, I eat different than Matt. I might go out and have a few adult co- uh, beverages once in a while. I don't need to do everything Matt does. But to find that little bit of motivation that, him, that he has and that his wife Erin has, that's what drives me to see how you go, to see Stoker doing it. And Les, 77 years old, and he's in there staying up Competing with us. Competing with us. Doesn't that, that's crazy. That, incredible. You know what it tells me? You know what it makes me feel? I don't sit there and go, uh, Les, you need to slow down, or Les, you're crazy for being here. I don't sit there and, and try to talk to anybody. I, all I say is that I, I hope, I pray that I'm with Matt Pendola yeah. training when I'm 77 76. years old. That's yes, crazy yeah. to me. Incredible. So you, you come... You come out of Mexico learning how to body punch at one and oh, do you come back and get another fight right away? Do you have to find a promoter? Do you have to find a coach? What happens there? I actually, I actually had a fight every summer. So I did. I came back from Mexico. I was there four to six weeks, came back, already had a fight being set up for me in Reno or Vegas, flew back into town, flew into Vegas. Skipper Kelt, the coach down in Vegas, who was the uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas boxing coach. He's, a, he's at Fight Capital Gym down there in Vegas, one of my very best friends. He cornered me. I would call him up, hey, Skip, I got a fight. I need you to corner me, and then I'm going back to law school in two weeks. And I literally would fly into town, you know, came up to Reno, checked in on people. No one went with me. This was, that was nothing. I was 1-0 and as a fighter. So here I am going down. I think I was 3-0 and at this, this particular fight I'm talking about. But I call my dad. Hey, Pop, we're fighting in Vegas this weekend. My best friend, Clint Cates. Hey, Cuddy, we're fighting in Vegas this weekend. That was it. We drove down there. I had probably had, you know, 10 people in the stands, you know, a couple of buddies from Vegas that, you know, that went to school up here that are down there. They showed up, won the fight. And then two, two weeks later, I'm back in law school. So and, it was crazy. And so are you four and oh, after your first four professional fights? No, yeah, I was, I was, I was, yeah, I was eight and oh until the contender eight and eight and oh with eight knockouts. But the beauty of it was is so here I am, we're coming back. See, there you go saying shit like that. And just again, just eight and oh with eight knockouts and you never, ever fought before college. No. And you're 8-0 as a professional. And I only had 30-something fights as an amateur. And a lot of these guys, you know, De La Hoyes and them had 300, 400, yeah. 500. So I was very lucky. I mean, what happened with me. But the cool part is, you know, so here I am you know, back in law school. And it's, you know, end of August. And people are like, so how was your internship? And people are talking about, oh, I was at the DA's office. I was at the public defender. I interned, I interned for this big personal injury firm downtown. And I was with the United Nations. People look at me. And they say, hey, Joey, what'd you do? I go, I was in Mexico City for six. Oh, would you enter? What'd you do at the consulate down there? I go, I was at Ponchos Rosales. So he's like, what's Ponchos Rosales? I say, one of the baddest gyms in freaking Mexico City, man, where Barrera's at. And these guys didn't even understand. What, what do you mean? I'm showing them pictures. I'm showing them video. They could not believe that here I am, a, a 2L, going to become a second-year law student. I'm sitting next to these guys that all do these internships, and I'm showing them my internship with the summer was... You know, you're being mentored by some of the roughest, toughest guys. 12, 12 <laughs> rounds with six different people, six two rounds yeah, at a time. Exactly. And, yeah. and tell me this, with, with your background going to law school and then interning in gyms and, and boxing rings is, and then having your relationship with the Lane brothers and Mills and guy, Mills Lane, what a stud. But did it have some common ground for you when you would see oh, yeah. Mills being go, going to law school? Was he like, yeah, hey, absolutely. He I was mean, a judge. Everybody, I, yeah. mean, I don't know if everybody out there knows, but Mills Lane was a judge in Nevada. Yep. That's where he made his living doing. Then he was a boxing referee. Yeah. Let's get it on. He made famous. Um, celebrity death match celebrity he's the, death he's the, match, he's the yeah. judge on there he was not only was he a friend and mentor so i ended up going to law school as a matter of fact i joined the military because of mills so our senior year of 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 college i'm in the ring and here's mills you know it's when i say senior year boxing the real season was the end of the year it was like april is when the nationals were but we'd always start obviously in the fall and so we're in there it's for it's the first i mean it's the end of my beginning of my first year and i have mills saying to me so what are you doing what are you doing next year what are you doing when you graduate so, I don't know. No idea what I'm doing. You, you, you need to go in the military. You need to go to law school. I'm not going in the military. I don't want to go in law, for law school for what? You got to go to law school. Well, if you look, and what I'm talking about, Jerry Maguire, a movie comes out with Tom Cruise. Jerry Maguire comes out, not to, excuse me, 1999. 
And in that movie, he's Jerry Maguire says how I ended up here out of law school. Well, I want to be a sports agent. I thought you had to go to law school to be a sports agent. So that's, that's the only, literally the only reason why I decided to take the LSAT and go to law school. I want to be a sports agent. But then I got Mills Lane in my ear saying, you know, you need to go in the military. I got a friend of mine telling me we can be fighter pilots. So I joined the Air Force, actually the Air Guard, for the purpose of hopefully becoming a fighter, fighter pilot someday. That never happened. <laughs> you know, I didn't become a fighter pilot, but I had some great in, you know, mentors, great people guiding me. I got me to do what I needed to do, and that's how I ended up where I ended up. So 8-0, you're pretty much like you're looked at now you got to be having some sanctions look at you of saying hey this kid's legit he's eight and with eight knockouts Is well you know happening? what though here's i remember telling sugar ray leonard this let's jump around a little quick so here we are we're, let's go to las vegas um after law school i'm you know it's 2004 the contender show is getting ready to come out and it's sugar shane mosley fighting uh winky Wright. it's in vegas he beats him the first time, and now he's fighting him the second time. And again, Winky whoops him again. And so we're, we're actually invited to Sugar, Slane's, Sugar Shane's uh, after party. But anybody who knows any fighters and anybody in the, in the fight industry, if you lose, you really don't have an after party the same, the same way. You might, but it's not the same. So uh, Shane loses, and so you know we're not going to the after party. But we're all dressed in suits with our shoes shine. And one of my buddies says, as we're watching the fight, they, they throw the camera. They show Sly on camera with sitting next to Sugar Ray Leonard. And they say, oh, the contender coming out this fall. And all my buddies, hey, there you go, man. Look, why don't you go down there and tell Sly you want to be on the contender? We all laugh. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll just walk up and tell him I'm going to be on the contender. Like, that's going to happen. So sure as shit, we're outside Rum Jungle. There's a, there's a restaurant in the Mandalay Bay called Lupe. It's an Italian restaurant right outside Rum Jungle. And everyone's getting crowded around. There's a big crowd for them. And everyone's like, what's going on? What's going on? We're walking through. And someone says, Sylvester Stallone's and they're eating. Well, my buddy Jamie Cogburn down in Vegas, if you ever drive around, drive around Vegas, you'll see a blonde lady on a billboard that says Cogburn Law. Yeah. It's my buddy Jamie Cogburn. So he, at the time, he's just a brand new lawyer. I'm just a brand new lawyer. And I'm with a buddy of mine who shells timeshares, you know? Got friends that go down like Chad Forrest or they go down to Vegas yeah. for a week and they end up with a timeshare. Oh, yeah. So this is one of my buddies selling timeshares. So I got an attorney and a timeshare guy go, hey, you Mr. Mouth, Mr. Talk My Way into the White House, why don't you go tell Stallone, you know, you want to be on the show? So they're jabbing me pretty hard and I'm bouncing around, you know, before, like before a fight, you know, you're jumping around on your knees and just kind of going, whoo, whoo, you know, getting all nervous, but I'm like, I got to do this. They're daring me. They're double dog, triple dog, daring me, betting me everything. So sure as hell, man, I freaking make a beeline for Stallone and this ginormous security guard tries to stop me. I don't know what I said. I got around him somehow and I ended up kneeling down next to Stallone. Imagine taking a knee next to someone who's sitting in a chair. I take a knee. I put my hand up. I said, Mr. Stallone. My name's Joey Gilbert, and I give him my little freaking bio. My name's Joey Gilbert. I'm a three-time national champ, four-time more American. I just graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno, a couple years ago with a degree in English literature. I heard you have a degree in English literature, Sly, and he kind of looked look at him and wink. I said, I, was, I also went to law school. I just graduated from law school. I took the bar exam. I don't have the results yet. I have also was in the military. I was in the Air National Guard. And blah, blah, blah. But real quick, I go, oh, and I was a three-time national champ, four-time all American as a fighter. I'm a pro now. I'm 8-0 with eight knockouts. And he looks at me, and he goes, after everything I I said everything I just said he looks at me he goes are you Italian and I said yes I am and he goes what's with Gilbert <laughs> shit you not I said I'm adopted by my stepfather and he goes oh like that he stands up at the table he goes gentlemen now who's sitting at this table Conrad Riggs uh let's see Mark Burnett Jeffrey Katzenberg Sugar Ray Leonard George Foreman some other studio Jeff Wald obviously like I said, Sugar Ray Leonard and Sylvester Stallone. He stands up at this table. He says, gentlemen, this is Joey Gilbert. He recites back everything I just recited to him without missing one thing. Three-time national champ, four-time All-American, got his law degree, got his college degree, you know, you know blah, blah, blah. He's going to be on our show. No way. That's exactly what happened. I never turned in an application. I never turned in a video. That next Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., I'll never forget this because my cell phone showed a 310 number. 310 number calls. I answer it. They say, hey, Joey, this is whatever the production company is in LA. We'd like you to come out here this week and, and, and see if we can uh, have a little trial with you or something like that. I drove out there with Pat Connors. Yeah. Uh, we went down there. I ended up filming the national promotional commercials, got my SAG card and got cast in The Contender. True story. Was it Mark Burnett that produced The Contender? Yes, it was. And he was at the table that night at Lupe. Yes, he was. The Italian restaurant in Mandalay Bay. Uh-huh. And you... 
you have to get a SAG card, which is an, an actor's guild card. No, you don't. You get that. I got that because I made the promotional made commercials. The promotion. Yeah, but I, I you just got it. I just was lucky to get it. I was the so, only guy that also got cast in the show that filmed the national. So again, this is movie worthy of you walk by a six foot seven security guard and figure out how to get around him. Yeah, forget. Don't even remember what you said because your adrenaline's rocking. Oh, yeah. You kneel down on a table in an Italian restaurant, which I'm thinking like Godfather is. <laughs> it's like, yeah. still, you know, they're, they're Quiet, talking. Quiet, dark in there, yeah. They're talking. I mean, we're talking big money. We're talking big big, big, big plans going on at this table right now. Foreman's probably getting some backing for the new grill. George Foreman that, grill. And then Burnett's getting ready to tell them about Survivor. And yeah. That, and all this stuff's popping off at this table. And here comes Joey Gilbert, 8-0, broken nose, two months at a time in Mexico City, bar exam, cocky as hell everybody wants to hate on him and now you have the balls to go up to sylvester stallone kneel down and say this 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 and this and have him stand up recite it back and bring you onto the show and i finished with my whole thing was mr stallone i'm blah 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 and i think i'd be great for your show and he looks at me and says oh yeah why? and i said wait you're italian then he stands up to afterwards he says so why i give him a little more background and like i said the rest is history i got a phone call to go out there we filmed it i got chosen and um absolutely and that is the difference i'll say this real quick Truly, one hundred percent. That was the athlete in me. That was the that was being thrown a curveball. That was athletes. someone saying to you, "Go, come well, on, think, tough think guy." Think about what you're doing. You're setting yourself up for for so, so, not so, just celebrity, but you're setting yourself up for success. And it's the entrepreneurial spirit to be able to walk into a room like that and look at somebody across the table is exactly what you did. Well, that's how Under Armour started. That's how Nike and Phil Knight, Phil Knight was going to China and developed running shoes. Everybody told him he was freaking nuts, that he was going to be a bum one day. And look at Phil Knight. What's he worth? 59 billion now? Incredible. Look at, look at the old, the, the guy that runs, the, the president of, of Amazon. Look at the old pictures of him in his office at three in the morning, making coffee on, in a microwave and people telling him, what are you doing? And look at him now. There's, there's that, that attitude in life. What you did is what gets things done. And then it's what makes people that don't have the ability or the balls to do that. Now they want to hate on you or they want to become keyboard muscle. And I'm saying that because now you really do through the contender, you gain national celebrity. And I saw it all the time. You were on a, you and Brinkley and the guys that were on that show were sitting next to Rocky Balboa. You were at parties in Beverly, in the Hollywood Hills with Rocky Balboa. With everybody. It was incredible. It was an incredible time in your life. And to, 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 to take that away from you, Joey, is stupid. For somebody to belittle that or say, oh, whatever, you know, anybody could do that. Again, it, it, can't, it doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't. First of all, if you would have went into that restaurant, Lupe and Manalee Bay that night and gave him that spill and you were full of shit mm -hmm. and you were lying. Yeah. That's one thing. But you really were eight. No, as a champion mm -hmm. or as a, as a pro with eight knockouts, you really did take the bar exam. You really did graduate med or uh, law school. You really did enter the armed forces. You really did become a three time NCAA champion, a four time all American in the box for the year. That, that stuff is what I'm telling is that people got to understand. That's why I wanted the story. To, I, I'm learning now of like, wow, it wasn't that Joey was 8-0 and and he put down a little application and him and Jesse had a tryout down in, at the Pepper Mill or the El Dorado in Reno and they got picked to be on the show. You made it happen with a little bit of prodding for some friends, but they knew you had it. They were calling you the mouth that could get into the White House. You did it. You did it. That, well, they knew you were going to do it. They knew you were going to be successful. And here's the deal. In life, the worst thing that could have happened besides getting thrown on your back, which who knows, you might have whipped that security guard too. The worst thing that could have happened is Sly would have said, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, and I believe that in life, man, walking forward. The worst thing they can say is no. You got a 50-50 chance of at, getting this thing at, done. At the worst. That's the, the worst. It's the worst. And I, and I really do. I mean, that's something I've never been afraid. And I do. And again, I'll say this again. It has been becoming athletics. It's because I was a student athlete. It's because I was constantly forced to adapt to a situation that I wasn't prepared for. I mean, I wasn't preparing for, but I was prepared for. I wasn't planning to be it, but I was prepared for it. And I really think that's what athletics does. I think that's what challenging ourselves every day does. I think that's what these kids, you know, hopefully will get back to in time. Now you transitioning into what we were going into before this, we're gonna get back to that because it's so awesome. So respectful as far as what that, what that entire journey entailed. When you talk about the attitude of an athlete, of, of a boxer, of a fighter, of a champion in life, in the ring, whatever, is it okay for Floyd, Mather, Floyd Mayweather Jr. to flaunt his money? Is it okay to be 50 and 0 and say anything that you want? Do people know that he feeds the homeless? Do people know that he does things for charities? Do people really understand that he, that he 
has made mistakes in life, which we all do. Are we, are, are we, um, geared to judge somebody because they might have a kid that they don't have a relationship with or, or are we able to judge somebody because they had to file bankruptcy because they didn't take care of their money? Or wh- wh- how far can you go as the public with our media these days and social media? Floyd bites it off. He asks for it. So that gives everybody the ability to judge him. So in return, if he's going to be judged, he's going to fight right back. How far is this going to go? How far can it go? Is he too arrogant? Does he have the, the right to do what he does? Or do you think as a person, hey, Floyd, just chill back. You're worth $300 million now. Don't lose the money again. Don't spend too much money. Don't talk smack again. I, can he, can, does he deserve the right to do the, what, what he does? You yeah, know where I'm going with this? Yeah, he, def, I mean, he definitely deserves the right to do it. Now, whether or not he should do it or not, that's a different story. I do think that people got to realize who Floyd is, though. Floyd was a guy who, who made his, his career on being controversial. He made his career on talking smack. I mean, we were there. We were at some of his initial fights. There were 3,500 people in there. Yeah. I had bigger fights than Floyd initially on. It wasn't until you know, after the De La Hoya fight, stuff started getting crazy. But Floyd had to find a way to attract people, and he's always done it with his mouth. And he took the page right out, out of Muhammad Ali's book. Now, is he a little more crass? Is he, crass? Is he a little bit more uh, you know, disrespectful? Yeah. I think so. I do think now that because he's not in the sport anymore and he is just a, a rich retired athlete, that maybe he, he would be better served if he was a little bit more mindful in what he says. But again, everyone's got. And if anyone expected any different thing from him, they're crazy. That's just where Floyd comes from. He believes in talking smack. He's used he's used talking smack to make himself a billion dollars. Think about it like that. He he was he was super skilled. He's sure, he had a lot of he had a lot of talent. But what made what separated him? His mouth. He made himself a villain. He made himself the bad guy that everybody hated. So they all showed up and still paid for the pay per view. And see if he lose. fights again, if he fights for the fifty one, I'm gonna buy it. Yeah. Okay, I don't care who it is. I'm gonna buy it yeah. just cause. It's just like Howard Stern. People wanted to see it just for the shock of what he wasn't gonna do or what he's gonna do. I think it's just how Floyd is. I w- I would say if if I had a if I had a, a way to to you know to, to to you know to counsel him, I would say, hey, you know what, Floyd, you know you know tone it down a bit. You know, don't don't be so out there. Don't be so off the charts. You know, but again. You know, you're not going to get you very far with Floyd. I think he's going to continue to do what Floyd does. Well, let me ask you that as far as celebrity goes. And I want you to think about some celebrities that we have instant access to. If we want to know where The Rock is, who's the Forbes just named the richest actor in history. Wow. Um, Kevin Hart, who's, uh, he's okay funny to me. He doesn't really make me laugh like uh, Eddie Murphy did, sure. but he's a worker. I mean, sure. this dude is working. He's got like yeah. game shows and he's got radio shows and he's got movies and he's got a stand up tour and he's got this thing with Nike and this marathon stuff. He's a worker. If we want to know what Kevin Hart's doing or his wife or his kids, all you got to do is look at his freaking social media. Yeah. You got these celebrities, right? The Rock, Kevin Hart, Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather was, uh, he was in, oh man, I don't know, Turkey or somewhere lately. And he bought like a $12 million watch. I don't even know what the watch oh, was. Yeah. It was insane. He's in this big beef with 50 Cent. And 50 used to be on the show with him on, on behind, you know, uh, 24-7 yeah. on HBO. And he used to be riding around on the little scooter with Boyd. He'd walk him into the ring with a live rap. And they were counting their money from the sports book. Yeah. And now they're hating on each other. My, my question to you is, when you have celebrity like that, what is too much? Why is there, is there a point to where does the rock have to show himself getting on a private jet all the time? Does Kevin Hart have to show himself drinking courtside NBA? Is that a motivator? Is, is Flay, when Mayweather shows off that watch or that $50 billion mansion he just bought in Beverly Hills, Joey, is that a motivator for people in the black community, people in the Hawaiian community or the Samoan community where the rocks from, does that motivate them to be better? Or is that kind of like, raw, raw, look at me. Is it too much for people to be able to know that every day the rock is flaunting money? Do they think he's flaunting money by having private jets when Kevin Hart does what he does or when Mayweather flaunts these Rolexes or is that motivating or is it flaunting money that people really don't need to see? Do you think that they're going too far by showing that stuff? You know, I don't think so. I think today's day and age is all about what you can show. I mean, look, how many times can you, you can't even trust people's social media profiles anymore. You can't trust people's pictures anymore. Everybody's putting on filters and adding something to it. I don't blame them. They worked hard. If they want to, if they want to showcase some of the things they're doing, some of their hard earned stuff, I'm all for it. I got no problem with that. I think it's when people start being disrespectful. I think it's when they start taking shots at people and being, you know, and just 
being terribly, terribly disrespectful that you cross the line. I, I think for me personally, I do get pumped up when I see those, when I see people posting stuff, goals, goals are a good thing to post. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that personally. And, and I don't, and I, and the reason I ask is because it's two sided to me and I'll, I'll take a screenshot when I see something that the rock does and it motivates me. And you don't know with social media. He says he's up at three in the morning. It could be nine o'clock at night when sure. he makes that video. We don't know, but we want to trust in him. We want to trust. And by his results, by what he's achieved from coming up as a Miami Hurricane football player, then the WWE, or amateur wrestling, then the WWE, then, you know, getting out of Vince McMahon's air and getting a Dwayne Johnson name and then creating this movie and this production, Seven, seven Bucks Productions, because he had $7 in his pocket when he was, you know, dirt poor when he became a wrestler. I, I think I got the story right. But you, these guys have achieved something. The success is there through hard work. The Rock didn't, wasn't handed that. No. He had good genes. His dad was a wrestler. He was built. He was ripped up. He had good genes. But there's a lot of people that have good genes that inherit a lot of money that don't amount to what the rocks amount to. I'm motivated. I'm captivated by it. It makes me want to be better. So let me ask you this. When the rock's the celebrity that he is and he goes into somewhere like St. Jude's and he visits sick children, is that okay to put on social media to say, rah, rah, look at me. Now I'm visiting the sick. Is that okay to do? Or is, is there anything that can be private anymore? Can you just not show me that you're at dinner with your kids tonight one time and just hold something sacred? Or maybe is this how he builds his empire by saying, hey, now I'm visiting the sick kids. Is that okay to do? You know what, man? Everyone's got a plan these days. I'm not really sure. I, I think it's okay, to be honest with you, because just like you said before, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, if, if otherwise it's going to be the same person that says, oh yeah, the rock's always putting pictures of his jet up. Why doesn't he show him doing anything? If you know, why can't he give back? You exactly. know, so then the second he does that, oh, now he's putting that out there just so he can get, you know, brownie points or, or whatever he's doing. I, I think, you know what, be you. If that's something that's important to you, something you're proud about and you want to showcase it, do it. I think it comes to the person, whoever's doing it, are they doing it for the right reasons? See, and I, and I, and I like that. That's what I like about talking to people is that I learn things. And at, at one time, maybe two years ago, I would say, man, I wonder why the rock does that. Why can't he keep that visit to St. Jude's private? Private. He went and did it. He, he's internally fulfilled. But now you bring up my argument of you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And he's probably doing it because, hey, yeah, I do live this lavish life. I, I've created this life that I have everything I'm ever going to want. I still take care of my wife, my kids. I want people to understand that I have this place in my heart for these people. I want them to know that my thoughts and prayers are with these families that are staying at the Ronald McDonald house and their kids are sick in St. Jude's Cancer Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. Maybe that's why he's doing it. If you think about it, that's probably why he's doing it. Because really, it's not going to make him another dollar. No. Nope. It's not going to bring him another fan. Um, he's doing that on his own through his hard work. I think that in this country, people support you on the way up. When Joey was an amateur. Oh, yeah. Joey, go Heck for yeah. it, man. Win that race. Joey's a champion. Oh, we're going to Joey's fight. Beat him. Now Joey's on the contender and he's with Stallone. That cocky, dude. he's at every party and he's drinking wine with Sugar Ray and like... Now they want to throw rocks at things that shine and knock you off that top ring of the ladder because they're afraid to try to climb up that ladder. They're afraid to take the first step to putting on the gloves and going in that gym up off of Sierra on, at, the, at, the, at Hans's gym by University of Nevada campus. They're afraid to take that next step of going to Mexico for two months of summer and getting your ass beat by six dudes in 12 rounds. I've seen those kind of fights in training. I've seen people go through it and I'm like, not me. They're afraid to take those steps to even get started, to start climbing that ladder. It's, little, like, it's little, like the movie Friday. They're afraid to take that ass whooping. Yeah, they're afraid to you take know, it. Everything's an ass whooping when you're learning. Lil Wayne, <laughs> I'm just quoting a rapper here, which people are going to go quoting a rapper. He has a line that says, if you want to get with on my level, you better get a tall ladder or a rocket ship. What a great analogy to live life to. What's wrong with that? Nothing. What's wrong with saying, hey, catch me if you can. We've been, cartoons, Bugs Bunny's been saying that for years. So it's, it's not okay for an entrepreneur or an athlete to say, hey, you might want to wake up earlier, Dub. You might want to yeah. get a rocket ship if you want to catch me. If you want to get up here, you better get to NASA. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as what you're saying, Joey, that you respect the guy. You can talk smack. You can sell a fight. Now, did Connor take it a little bit too far in New York that night by throwing that <laughs> through the window of that bus and scaring that bus driver? Hell yeah, he did. You don't put people in harm like that. That's sure. a little too much. But as far as selling a fight, Conor McGregor is probably worth 200, $200 million right now. He got a fight with Floyd Mayweather. Now we're transitioning with how I wanted to into Floyd Mayweather. To me, absolute, I don't know if I'm going to call him an icon like Mike Tyson. I don't think I would. But as far as a boxer, as far as commitment, and, and somebody that had, it was so good at his craft, is there anybody better? 
Than Floyd Mayweather? Yeah. Junior. I, I don't, I, you know what? I don't think so. In at least in this day and age, although I gotta, I gotta say one thing, Andre Ward, man, people don't talk enough about Andre Ward. Andre Ward fought the same type of competition Floyd did. You know, I'm not going to say they were protected. I think, I think Andre, I think Dre in his, in his last few years fought a lot of tough people. You know, he really did. I think he's one of the best out there. One of the best pound for pound that people don't talk about. I really do. I mean, I think, I think Mayweather is unparalleled too. I think, you know, he's, he's going to, is he definitely going to go down in the history books? Absolutely. But I mean, again, it depends on what kind of fight fan you are. You know, there's the guys out there that want to see a blood and guts warrior like Arturo Gotti or Mickey Ward. They don't want to see a, a technical, you know, ring generalship, you know, a master of angles like Floyd Mayweather. So that, that, that discussion is always going to be out there. I think it's too hard. I mean, I've got guys that will damn near come to blows over the fact that Floyd isn't that good of a fighter versus someone like Muhammad Ali. And you're just like, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't get it, but you know, Floyd Patterson, you know, there's some guys out there that are, that are probably right there along with Floyd. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know and I know some that. guys that'll come to blows over this argument is if Floyd is in the octagon with Connor, let me finish. Connor throws a kick and a fake or a, or a shin kick or a thigh it kick. It doesn't or, last around. Okay. Floyd doesn't, doesn't last, probably doesn't make it out of the first minute. So Floyd though, can't keep him at bay with his hands and his quickness. No, he, he's going to, he's going to be able to kick that Floyd. Connor's going to run right through him, grab him up and th- power plex him, whatever you do and slam. You saw how much bigger he was than him. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, and as a guy that cross trains and cross trained all the time with those, I mean, I, I got real good at my takedown defense, but if they wanted to get me down and they just ran in, you know, recklessly and ruthlessly and take a Robbie Lawler, you know, something like that, they're, they're going to get you down. Right. You know what I'm saying? So Ruthless. I don't think it ever would have made it. I mean, it, Floyd was smart that he called the rules, but I mean, come on. A lot of people didn't like that fight. I thought Conor McGregor did phenomenal. And I think if he wouldn't have punched himself out in those first couple rounds, if he would have been a little bit more articulous, a little bit more mindful of what he was doing and a little bit more, you know, economical with those power punches, I think it would have been a whole different ball game. Really? I really do, man. You don't think that Mayweather just played with him for eight I, rounds? No. I thought, I thought he was giving, I thought the first couple rounds, those first four rounds, Mayweather had all he could fucking deal with and then some. You could tell some of those shots. I mean, that he was a big, he was a bigger guy. He was a rougher guy. And, 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 and McGregor didn't care. He was going at him. I just think that if I was McGregor's training, if I would have been training McGregor, I would have slowed him down the first couple rounds and just said, look, you know, spend the first four rounds getting used to the speed and, and see him and then start jumping on him. But again, I thought it was a great fight, man. He I thought he like- gave, he gave Floyd a tougher fight than the last freaking five guys that fought him. Really? I, I Did you watch him. a rematch? Yeah. You would. Hell yeah. In a second. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting because a lot of people think that Floyd toyed with him for eight rounds and that Floyd could have smoked him at any time he wanted. I, I don't agree with that at all. You well, saw you know some the of the game. shots that he, that he took and, and shots that Floyd took that he would have never taken, that no one in his camp would have said, just let him hit you like that. No way. That never would have happened. I just think that Floyd was lucky. I think that you, know, you saw a lot of things. You saw a guy declining. He hadn't fought in almost a year and a half. I think you saw, I think you could see a lot. I think you could see Floyd was one foot out the door when that fight happened. When you talk about somebody like Floyd Mayweather and that caliber of fighter, that attitude that he's had at 50 and 0, that what you called him the, the villain, he, he wanted to create that mystique that, hey, I know you want to see me lose, so come mm-hmm. watch the fight and yep. see if I lose. He had to. Where does he go in the sport? After he's retired. And let's say that he doesn't want to just go sit on a beach or in a mansion. Where does, what would he do in this? Could he coach? Could he commentate? What does somebody like, what, is there any afterlife in boxing for somebody like Mayweather Jr.? Well, I don't think so, man. I mean, I think afterlife for Floyd is going to all be, you know, it's all going to go the direction of, of his mouth for, for, for lack of better, better words. He says a lot of stuff and that's going to shy a lot of business people away from him. It's going to shy a lot of, you know, sponsors or, or how everything gets done. I don't care how much money you're worth. If you're going to put something on TV, whether it's a promotion or something, you're going to have sponsors. But if you got someone out there on Instagram saying, you know, inappropriate stuff, uh, they're not going to want to work with you. And I think Floyd, because he's not the superstar anymore, he's not the guy in there laying it all on the line. And again, let me just start up saying, I am a Floyd Mayweather fan. I am not talking smack. I'm just being honest. People always you. say that, you know, you know, fact, you know, f- facts don't care about your feelings. Uh, that's the truth. And so I really just think, you know, we're having an honest conversation. I think Floyd said some things, does some things, acts a certain way. He's got a strip club in Vegas now. I just don't know who touches him and does business with him like that. That's in that corporate, you know. Um, big business type thing right now. I might be wrong, but I think how Floyd stays relevant in the sport is he stays as a promoter. 
He keeps promoting fights. He stays with his Mayweather promotions and keeps bringing up. I don't think he has it in him to coach. And and what when you talk about Mayweather, where, where's your end game right now? You're, you're an attorney. You're a practicing attorney in Reno. You're involved in several businesses. You have a family. You like to travel. Are are we going to see Jerry Maguire, Joey Gilbert business someday? Are we going to see another promotion company like you did with the Mills, with the Lane brothers, with Tommy and uh, Terry? Terry, um, what what's on the horizon? Well, you know, it's funny you ask that because I do still have one of the one of the few you know licensed promoter licenses in the state of Nevada. I'm a boxing, I'm a licensed boxing promoter. Um, I do want to get back into that. I just, I'm I in. I'm in. I want to do it. I, well, I took a break, man, for a while because of the fact that once I finished. The first couple of years that I was done boxing, I got phone calls to fight all kinds of people. Kelly Pavlik, believe it or not, 2011, right as he was trying to get back in the game. And I just, I wanted to take a good, a good break from the sport. I wanted to be so far away from it that I was never enticed to come back in. Now that that's kind of happened, I'm, I'm older now and I've got, you know, my business, my law firm doing well. I would like to start doing some more promotions or, or possibly even managing people. The other thing is I took the NFL exam about four years ago to be an agent. I didn't pass by a couple questions and I didn't want to take it again. I was still, it was just, just finishing fighting. I think I'm going to go take that again and get that done. And so I, w- I do, I want to do a combination of some Jerry Maguire and some boxing promotion but I want to work with guys that I, I'll know right from the beginning I, I actually wouldn't even talk to them or, or think about working with them they didn't fit a certain mold or do things a certain way but if I found the right fighters to work with I definitely would work with them and uh, who knows who knows where we go from there and when you talk about the on the horizon and you're part of a community in what they call the biggest little city in the world in Reno Nevada and you got a lot of pride in that and you should I do I'm third generation here I don't know where you fall into the generational code of Nevada, but this is the fight capital of the world. Las Vegas is the fight capital in, in Reno and Tahoe from Ray Boom Boom Mancini to George Foreman to you name it. They trained here. They mm-hmm. fought here. Hearns and Sugar Ray. And you go into Pinocchio's male bathrooms at the spark at the sparks location. You see all the old, I love those fight posters, mm-hmm. man. You see them around my place here. I, I love the fight game. There's, there's certain individuals in your life that mold you on a daily basis that motivate you quote unquote life coaches. Talk about Rick Revilio is a man just real quick in the way of he never got in the ring. He was a stud athlete at Bishop Minogue Catholic high school in Reno. His, his, his dad, Jack and his uncle Tom had a successful business that Ricky got involved in and then bought them out and runs today to where I would consider it one of the top businesses in the state of Nevada. And I'm sure you would too. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean it might not be the most revenue because we have a lot of big casinos here, but as far as a business that gets it done on a daily basis and you hear the blue team, what does a man like Rick Revilio mean to you as a mentor, a friend, and somebody that you've watched just explode as a, as a, just a, 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 an awesome citizen of this community? Well, Rick, Rick, he's a different human being, man. He's another guy that does it right. You know, he does it every day the same way. He's got a routine. He's consistent. You know, he's honest. You know, if he says he's going to do something, he does it. Just, you know, just one of those old school guys. Rick might be a younger guy, but he's, he's, an, he's got an old school, old world mentality, man. And I think that's what makes people successful. I mean, I've, I've reached out to Rick over the years. He's always been a tremendous boon for me, someone that I can always rely on. And it's because, like I said, you know, he's not afraid to put in the work. He has, you know, made himself. He sure he came from a family that was doing very well, but he got in there, took took over that business at a time when things were not doing well, and he was able to, you know, do some amazing stuff. And now they are one of the better, if not one of the the, the titans here in the state. So when you were in the ring, would you look out and look for him? Would I look for him? No, Rick. You know what's funny about Rick and I is that. He was uh, he was the, the quiet confidence for me. He was a guy that you know I always knew had my back. He he always I think he funded every training camp I had. Um, was always there in my corner for me. And for Rick, it was just a matter of I wanted to do my very best for him because I know he was doing everything he could to help me. So it was just kind of like a mutual respect. Like, look, I know you believe in me. So if I if my nose is broken in the fifth round and I can still fight, I'm gonna fight. You know, I mean that that's what kept me going. What kept me going in that ring was the Rick Revilios, was the guys, the Matt Pandolas here in town that I knew I couldn't let down. Guys that I knew got up every day, much like myself, and followed the same routine. There's a certain good, good certain amount of things every day, Chad. I might not want to do, but I do it because it's discipline. I do it because I know if I get it done, uh, I'm gonna be able to get to the to get my goals. You know, and if I don't do it i'm not going to get to my goals so again man rick reveal is a special person in the sense that he's a he's a guy you can model he's a guy you can emulate you know they like the same thing they say in business you know you, you know um no 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 use you know re, re, redoing the wheel you know what i'm saying but um if you got a guy that you can just emulate and follow and you do what he does and, and you get the same results that's where rick comes in i just kind of looked at him as a human being as a person and say you know what 
I'm going to emulate him a little more. You know, I don't know what he does, but, and then you just get around and go to lunch and see all the things we do from drinking more water to drinking a green drink, to getting his workouts into the family time, the personal time, how he spends time with employees, how he communicates. You just kind of look at that and go, I'm going to duplicate that, man. And so that's, I, that's what, that's what I try to do with a lot of my mentors. I see what they've done successfully and just try to copy it. Yeah. And it's kind of like picking out a shirt. And that's the, when I talk about Rick Revilla, I tell people, when you go to pick out a shirt that you see somebody, I feel that shirt that you have on, go, man, that's nice fabric. The secret is finding that cloth that Ricky was cut from. Yep. And in today's society, in today's world, there's a lot of deterrence of finding that cloth. It's harder to find. It's oh, yeah. harder to find those employees or those, those leaders that were cut from that cloth that Ricky was. And what you're saying, if you get to go spend a day with him, and it takes me five minutes. When I walk into his office, this aura comes over me like, holy shit, I'm going to be successful. I want this. I'm not going to copy him. I want to learn. I want to mm -hmm. be motivated. And you know what Ricky does? He turns around and says, what you do motivates me. Yeah. And what you do motivates me, Joey. And what Rick does motivate. And then he turns around and goes, Chad, I can't believe what you've built. What, the, not many people can sit down and say that they're doing what they, that kind of stuff and li live in their dream and, and getting to wake up and hunt every day. And I go, this is Rick Revilio saying this. And that's what sets him apart is that he understands that success doesn't come easy. And that if you have that mutual respect and you give people praise and you build them up and you don't try to tear them off that ladder, the last thing in the world that I want to see is one of my friends succeed and have somebody go, oh, whatever, he, his dad put him there or he inherited. That's so dumb, man. If they're there, support them, keep supporting them. And that's what Rick does. And it's evident by the charitable donations, the leadership, the, the, the booster clubs of the University of Nevada, Reno, all the different high school programs. The guy had to get a 1-800 hotline set up because of the donation requests that come into his life. He had to get a full-time employee to answer the phone just about donations. Yeah, I because know. everybody wants to, not that they want Rick's money, they want that logo on their outfield fence. They want that logo on their gym wall. They want that blue team logo on their sweatshirt or the back of their little league shirt. Yep. That's my mindset. I don't want to go to Rick and say, Rick, I need your money. I want to go in there and say, Rick, I want your blessing. That's why I go talk to Rick. Rick is, what do you think? You know, is this the smart thing to do? I went to him and this was my, my question. When I said, Rick, I want to get ingrained in the community more because I've, I fell out. I went on this little, this little 10 year deal of trying to build these national brands and having some success. And I want to, I want to get back in the, in the, in the loop in the, in the community. And he goes, man, why? And I said, because it means everything to me. He goes, but you're doing this and you're doing that. And I said, yeah, but I want to get on a board here. I want to help the boys and girls club. We got the sons of Nevada. Where do I start? What's the best one to do? And he helps me. He take, he, I don't know if you get 60 days, you know, scheduled out for a lunch with yeah, Rick Revilio, yeah. you're lucky. You're doing but good. when I get it, I take advantage of it and I want to learn from him. And the last thing I want to end with is that our mutual com our mutual common denominator in life right now is Matt Pendola. Yeah. And I think Matty is a different soul too, to where he is that guy. He's the best at what he does. The best, right? Hands He's down. cut from that same cloth. Yep. He might not be the guy that can get up and, and go and talk to the, He can talk to the football team about something different than Ricky will. Ricky will go into a room and he'll make you feel like you're getting ready to be Rudy. Like I could put the yeah, pads like on and go be the 11. Tall. Yeah. And bulletproof. And, but it's not fake. There's nothing fake about either of those two individuals. And I think that the money that I spend with Matt and Aaron at Pendola training. Yeah. I, I I'm vain and I want to be in shape and I want to be motive, but I want to take something out of every workout. And I take something away of how Matt lives his life. I'm not going to emulate it a hundred percent. And I don't think you need to, but again, I think a, a, an ingredient in life, Gilbert, is finding a little motivation out of everything you do in the day. If you fail, but what did I learn? I didn't catch a fish today, but I learned that if I do this or this flies this or I cast this way, I didn't, my daughter didn't swim very good today, but I was able, she was able to learn that if she does this, she's going to get a better time off the wall. There's so many things that you can do as an, that comes back to the mindset of an athlete and competitiveness and not just being handed a participation award. Ricky okay. doesn't hand them out. Ricky doesn't hand out participation awards. He makes you go get it because that business was in trouble at one time. This whole community was in trouble with the recession of 2007, 2008. And he could have shut his doors. He could have laid off everybody under the moon. And you know what he did? He, he's bigger now than he's ever been because he followed that analogy of Henry Ford. When times are tough, you keep the name going and you, you make sacrifices to stay in there. And that's the mind of an athlete. That's the focus, right? Agreed. That's what we're talking about today. Your career has done that. I want to come back and talk about more because we've only got to the contender. 
I want to learn. I want to hear about those fights. I remember watching them on, on national TV, seeing you on national commercials and doing the races on the beach in the sand against <laughs> Jesse Brinkley, your friendship with Jesse Brinkley. Now your friendship with Nate Diaz and all of the MMA fighters that, you know, um, what your goals are in life. You're, 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 an in, you're influential. You have the ability to influence people. And I, and I want to say that because people, the easiest thing to do is assume. And all and Coach Dalton used to say, God rest your soul, Coach Dalton. But he always used to say, that just makes an ass out of you and me when you assume. And it does. Mm-hmm. It spells True. it right for you. True. Don't assume that Joey is cocky. Don't assume that Chad's not going to talk to you. Don't assume that somebody's untouchable or unapproachable. Do what it takes to get to Sylvester Stallone when he's sitting at that table. And it paid off. Hell and yeah. that's what life's all about. It ain't easy. It's not easy. I better speak like I have good grammar here because I do know how to speak. But it's, it ain't easy, buddy. It's not. And God bless you for what you do. I'm glad I'm friends with you. To, I want to learn more someday. There's so cool. much to talk about. I want to meet Mike Tyson. We're going to do that. I think that you're trying to catch some of my records at the gym. I mm-hmm. keep setting them on a, on a weekly basis. <laughs> yep. I'm trying. I'm gunning for them for sure. <laughs> he can't even keep a straight face. He said, guys, it's Joey Gilbert. Google him. Look at his career because... There is a way that be cut from that cloth that we talk about with Pandola, Rick Revilio, Joey Gilbert, guys that separate themselves and continue to push people and motivate people. And most importantly, are respectful and passionate about life and their leaders, leadership skills, no participation awards. I might be wrong. Joey might be wrong. We might not. Let's just figure it out. Let's, uh, let's, let's strive to be champions. This has been a podcast. I'm Chad Belding. This life ain't for everybody. Today's episode was brought to you by our friends in Utah at the great supplement company, Mountain Ops. Thank you, Jordan and Matt, for everything you guys do for the Foul Life Banded and this life ain't for everybody podcast. Joey Gilbert, any last words? No, man, just thanks for having me. Excited to do this and looking forward to doing more. Yeah, Joey will join us some more. We'll get him and Matt Pandolin here. We're headed to sushi now. We're allowed to have about just a little bit of rice, but mostly raw fish today. And uh, look for Joey Gilbert. Google him. Check him out. He's motivational. He's inspirational. And uh, he's a heck of a guy to uh, show your kids that perseverance and just a little bit of attitude and maybe a slight touch of cockiness (laughs) can get you a long way in life. Chad Belding, This Life Ain't For Everybody. Tom, go ahead and start that song. Leith Lofton. What you gonna do when the money's all gone?